I live near a train, so I apologize for that. Um, so yes, the, my opinion is that it's purely control. Now, my epiphany was when I went to Senegal and I saw uh, the Gory Island and I saw the church built on top of all of the um, enslavement castles or um, dungeons as you, they're both castles and dungeons. And I then saw the Catholic Church. And as I continue to study, I learn how involved, if not the catalyst for enslavement of Black people, was indeed the Catholic Church. It's an effective political tool. The images are very controlling. And I think I'm going to stop right there, and, and then we can chase the, the, my answer in the question. OK, so she stops at one minute. Um, so for the people just coming in, we're going around, and each person is choosing that one question to ask. They got three minutes to answer, up to three minutes to answer, and then we're going to go into clarifying questions. So um, her answer was on her idea of America's political agenda with religion as it pertains to Black people. We have a first clarifying question in the audience. You can raise your hand. I can see you if you raise your hand. If you if you're if you can cut on your video, it'll be easy for everybody. But um, there might be a raise your hand option here. So I'll ask the first clarifying question. Um, do you think that? A concept of liberation theology could be used to not make that tool oppressive to Black people. Somebody like your question? <laughs> um, yes. Wait, 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 wait. If you're not talking, on mute, if you're not talking, mute your phone so we don't feedback. All right, go ahead. I, I. With only three minutes, you really can't get into the history of Christianity and how it evolved. But in answer to your question, yes and no. Um, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of oppression within the Americas as it relates to Black people. Liberation theology can be used for us to relieve some of the habits that we have of. Um, disassociating ourselves with our indigenous ways of, of respecting and worshiping God and acknowledging ancestors. So yes, I do think that the original intent of um, the followers of Jesus was actually liberation theology, but it has been co-opted. It was co-opted by the Romans. Can the oppression stop as it, as it relates to us retraining on our conditioning? I, I think that's more complicated. Do we have another clarifying question? Diablo? I mean, what do you mean by clarifying questions? I'm, I'm a little sketchy on the-, the okay. okay, so let me, let me, let me uh, clear it up. So after the three minutes, um, of answering the question, the audience can ask clarifying questions, not rebuttal or debate, but if you have a rebuttal, format your rebuttal in a, in a clarifying question manner. So put it in a question form if you have a rebuttal. After that is over, everybody's went up to 10 minutes, we'll have the debate at the end. So right now, if you have anything that she's saying or said that you need clarifying, or you might disagree with it, ask it in a clarifying manner for her to clarify her answer. Okay, I have two questions. First of all, uh, liberation theology. First of all, theology means the, the, the acknowledgement and worship of the God. Is there any evidence of the existence of a God? Number two, are there any historical concrete examples of anyone applying liberation theology to liberate themselves from their oppressor, mainly the, the very theologies that was, in, that, that was imposed on them by
by their oppressors, i.e. Uh, African Muslims liberating themselves from Arab oppressors or African enslaved Africans using Christianity, any manifestation or denomination of Christianity to liberate themselves from Christian oppressors? I'm, I'm gonna first answer with yes to your first question and yes to your second question. And then I'm gonna go back and respond. Is there any evidence that there is God? Yes. But then you got to follow that with, so how do you define God? That's when it becomes more complicated to me. Secondly, is there any evidence of, or examples, historical examples of people liberating themselves with um, liberation theology? I would argue that that was the whole purpose of the Christian movement before the Romans came in, and that was for liberation. As it relates to modern day, well, the closest to modern day is there have been priests in Central and South America who actually coined the phrase liberation theology, and they attempted to break away from the Catholic Church and were then become they became martyrs have they been a successful with the liberation theology i think it depends on how you define success as a for, as far as actually throwing off the oppressor no one to my knowledge has actually been successful with completely overthrowing european domination once they go in with Christianity indoctrination. Lena, was that a question? Ms. Ms. T? Oh. Anybody else have a clarifying question? Uh, Ivan? Got three minutes. Um, did you see the interview with James Cohn? The one that yes. was in the chat? I, I watched all of the, the videos. <laughs> um, so when he spoke about um, uh, the any for the religion that is a staple in whatever culture, uh, the dominant religion always inflicting violence. Um, how you feel like that is relevant and relates to uh, today? I think that today. We have been, now I'm talking about black people, we have been so well indoctrinated that we do some self-hate and we do some self-indoctrination, I mean, self-harm, self-violence in so many different ways. Um, I do believe that some of that stems from the habits that we developed through the Christian faith. Now, I'm, I'm saying this very, I'm, this is very loose because I don't believe that entirely. I believe that we took Christianity and made it our own, combining it with a lot of indigenous and African religions and spiritual practices. But I also feel that it has hindered, it, it did well for a season, but I believe that it has hindered our growth, to, especially when it comes to overthrowing our oppressor. It has created us to become a docile people. We got a minute and 50 seconds. Any more clarifying questions before we go to the next person? Dag, y'all don't agree, man. I know. <laughs> oh, come on All right. with it. <laughs> All right. No more clarifying questions? No? Everybody? Oh. I do oh. have a question. <laughs> okay. So, um, to the original question, uh, how can liberation theology uh, free people? Um, she said earlier uh, something about there being existence of God, and somebody else said something about, um, you know, how has the the supposed existence of God or belief in God freed anybody so far. And I'd say that, um, you know, religion is interdependence on something outside of yourself, someone to, that's supposed to come at the end of the day and 
and carry you through, right? Bring you resources or win your battle. And I think there, uh, we can all say that there is no evidence of that ever happening in any situation. So whether there's a God or not, it has never played any significant role in coming out of the sky or wherever, what, by whatever means you think this God lives. To 40 seconds to get your question in. So yeah, my seconds. question is, is what has this God done for, physically done for anybody or any oppressed group? regardless of where this guy derives from. I don't know what her question is, but I'm going to sort of answer what I think. And this is what was when I said yes. And then I went back after that and said, it depends on what you define as God. I don't define God through any of those things. Like that big man in the sky with the beard and has all this power and controlling in a, to me, that is not my definition of God. So in answer to your question, is there a God for me in my life? I have had the experience of the miracles, but not as it relates to that definition of how we've been taught. So, okay. what, so, so what you're saying? So wait, 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 wait. That's not the rebuttal time. So listen, if she's around, you can we can do it later. So we're gonna go I'm to the gonna next person. Go ahead. We're gonna go to the next person's question. And so I think Asafo is next. Um, and then let me know who wanna go next. Y'all can kind of like message to get in line, but Asafo and then Michael and whoever else. But we'll go ahead. And then Laura and uh yeah, Marcel. So go ahead, Asafo. Tell us the question and read the question and then I'll start. Okay. I don't, can, first of all, I hope everyone can hear me. Everyone can hear me? Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Larry. Uh, I want to um, address uh, the question. I believe it's question number 17. I'm sorry I don't have it in front of me. Uh, um, I can, I can read love, it. Does, do you have it? If you, yeah. if you go, I appreciate it. So question 17. Is God love? Does God love your enemies? How does God want you to interact with your enemies? Um, my answer to that question will be uh, very brief. Uh, so I draw my answer for that question from James Cone's uh, book, A Black, Liber A Black Theology of Liberation, in which he says, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have the direct quote, but um, that uh, a God of justice, a God of uh, love cannot be, uh, a God of black people cannot be a God for also for uh, the racist white oppressors of black people. So either God is a God of the black oppressed or God is a God of the white oppressor. He cannot be both. And if uh, there is a, a if God's love is extended uh, also to the white oppressor, that we have a responsibility as black people to reject God's love altogether. Um, and I mentioned this before uh, in another panel discussion, but there's a book by Christopher Hedges, who was a student of James Cone, and was, uh, I believe, a Presbyterian minister, is a Presbyterian minister as well. He uh, wrote uh, in his book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, an incident where the Jews who were in the concentration camps, I believe it was Dachau, uh, actually put God on trial. They put, he, they put God on trial for what has happened to them and for God allowing that to happen to them. And they found God guilty for being negligent and turning his back on the Jewish people because of uh, their experience in the Holocaust. And, and I think uh, we need to have that type of, if nothing other than psychological, kind of a psychological reckoning that, you know, we need to begin to worship and identify with the God that sees black people as his, his or her chosen people. And, um, and stop identifying with the God that loves all people. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the end of my answer. 
Yeah, okay, I, I think I did something crazy. All right, so anybody have a clarifying question? The people are just coming in, so I, I think I see a Baltimore number. I don't know if that's you, uh, Brother Heber, but um, for the people who have phones, if you can, I don't know, do video, video at any time or text, let us know who's who. But any clarifying questions for Brother Asafo? I have one. Um, so you said that um, God, the same God that is the oppressor of black people cannot be the same God that is of the white people allowing the oppression to happen. So how would you say that fits in with the statement that God is omnipresent? And moreover, because I was going to ask a question to um, the, anim the, the, the breath of life that God gives us is the same one that everybody is animated with. Whatever you do with that, is, do you believe that people are able to do whatever they want with that? Or do you believe that it's sectioned off to, oh, well, this, this, the, your God is allowing you to do that and this entity is allowing you to do that? Um, well, regarding the, the omnipresence, I, I don't see how, uh, You're perhaps I'm missing the premise of the, no, that was sorry. us. Okay. Perhaps I'm missing the premise of, of the question regarding God's, uh, uh, omnipotence or omnipresence, I believe. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how that would take away from, uh, God being, us identifying God as a God of, of, of black people. Uh, I, I don't see, I don't see them as, as, uh, mutually being two contradic contradictory ideas. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, now regarding God's breath and, and all people and what have you. And, and I, I, I presume not, you know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, that you're speaking to the idea of free will perhaps. Okay. Um, Not to be overly dismissive of the question, but uh, I think, you know, in this context, we need to uh, come up with, we need to begin to question as black people, and I say this all the time, we need to be begin to question everything, literally everything that we've come to accept as a race of people. We need to be able to kind of psychologically break with things that have been taught to us uh, even talking about theology, whether you talk about sociology, psychology, everything we've learned in education, everything we've learned about uh, culture, things like that. And a part of that is, uh, I believe, identifying with God and seeing God as a God that is intimately a part of us. And um, whether you know, what, what free will has to play in that. Uh, I'm not a theologian. I, I'm, I'm not even going to presume to, to have a, a, an adequate answer for that. But uh, I'll just say that I think if it's in the best interest of Black people to identify God as a God of Black people and identify God as a God that will, uh, that will side with us in the eventual race war, and the war against white supremacy, uh, I think that would be healthy psycholo psychologically for black people. I think it would be rather cathartic for black people to reject any God that uh, embraces uh, the demons of this planet as much as he would embrace, or he or she would embrace uh, his or her own. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that probably is an adequate answer to your no, question, that's, but that's, that's all I have. That's satisfactory for me. The only other thing I was about to uh, say was, um, so that includes rejecting everything that is in the Bible um, because that is allegedly the word of God um, as unpractical for our people. Is that the question? Yeah. Oh, did you understand the question? So would it, would it include rejecting the Bible? Yeah, if you're rejecting, if, if we are rejecting the God of the Bible, 
are we actually rejecting the teachings in the Bible also? Um, and again, we, we have to, uh, again, I, I don't claim to be a theologian. Uh, if it comes to, if it comes to a point where the Bible is, 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 is a document that is uh, teaching us to embrace our open enemies, then I would say, yes, we would have to reject that document or accept that document as just a document with no, with no connection or no divine or spiritual connection at all. It's just a document. Uh, I don't know, there's another aspect to your question. Maybe I'm, I'm thinking I missed. No, I don't think so, but um, I agree with you. All right. Ivan got a question and who else got a question? If nobody else, I'll ask, ask, ask Ivan. Um, so you, you kind of uh, spoke about uh, questioning um, what we've been taught, uh, even as far as religion. So do you believe that there are <clears throat> outdated parts of the Bible or parts that are no longer relevant uh, to how we live in life, live life in society now um, whatsoever? Uh, I, would, I would say so. I think that... Um, Again, just going back to the general idea of, of you know, just questioning things and, and revolutionizing the way we look at the world, the way we see ourselves. You know, it, it, like I said, we, there are certain things that may, be, uh, that may be unthinkable, but we have to begin thinking about the unthinkable. You know, that, that comes to saying, okay, well, we're going to accept parts of the Bible that uh, embrace who we are as an African people, and we're going to reject parts of the Bible that don't. I think that's a, a useful way to look at the Bible, okay? Because uh, quite frankly, that's the way white folks look at the Bible, you know? And, uh, you know, it didn't matter if, you know, uh, there was no theological uh, basis for the idea that black people were inferior to white people. They taught it as, as a, a religious doctrine until they, you know, regained the, until they had the power that they have all over the globe and then they turn around and tell us, oh, you all are equal to us, aren't you? Oh, okay. Well, but, you know, of course they're saying it, you know, verbally. They're giving that kind of these verbal platitudes to us about equality and all like that. But you see, no reparations are being given out. No banks are changing hands. No, you know, no institutions are paying out money from, you know, their benefit from slavery or anything. Nothing like that. It's just, it's just platitudes, you know. Empty, empty words, but they use the that idea that the religious sanction of white supremacy to um, to have what they have and gain what they have gained. Uh, Twenty seconds. What do you say for people who don't recognize the word or idea of God and dealing with people who still use the word God? Is it necessary or possible for those two black people to build? Okay, I didn't get all of the question. I'm sorry. Is it is it possible for black folks who are pro God, believe in God, and black folks who don't even want to have this word or thought there? Is it possible for both of those people to build together in fighting or moving out of the system? I mean, we we have to. I mean, I don't think we really have any other choice. I mean, the the only other alternative to uh, unity and fighting against the system of white supremacy would be our genocide. So uh, I don't think we have any other choice. And those who absolutely refuse, say, I'm going to stick with this white Jesus, come what may, we're just going to have to accept them as being people who are mentally ill and just you know deal with them on that level. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right, so we got Brother Michael next. Who wants to go after Michael? All right, we have four of them, and then y'all, y'all, and then then Diallo, and then Jimmy, then Brian. Okay, we'll go in that order. All right, what um? Oh, we Michael first. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Tell us the question you're answering, and you can read it. And then when you start, I'll start in three minutes. Got it. Question number five. Who does God like and who is he, she, it, they, punishing and why? So as a former atheist, 
Um, I now consider myself to be an omnist, simply meaning that I believe that all religions come from the same source and lead to the same place. And so we have been conditioned to believe that there is this white guy up in the clouds taking notes of our lives, waiting for us to screw up to condemn us to this fiery furnace called hell. I personally do not see God that way. We've projected human characteristics on God, thinking that God acts like a human being. So this human being type God, this anthropomorphic God, gets mad at us, is pissed off at us, so what does he do? He cuts us off or doesn't support us or doesn't love us. And so we have this illusion that this God is a person that's, again, condemning us or loving us based on how we believe in it. I personally do not adhere to that philosophy. I see God as an acronym, which is the grand overall design. So I choose to lean towards a scientific approach to God, meaning that my belief is that there is a divine energy and intelligence that created and is still creating this amazing universe that we live in. Every human being has equal access to this divine intelligence. Now, I define spirituality as the moment-to-moment -moment recognition and acknowledgement of my connection to something greater than myself. And so I don't need to have a label or a title to understand that this energy, this intelligence, permeates my very being. It is the same energy that keeps the planets aligned, that causes the plant to grow. So from my perspective, this energy and intelligence doesn't judge, doesn't condemn, it only loves. And it is our responsibility to connect, to understand, and accept that this love is infinite. And so therefore, there's no person that God likes and doesn't like because God doesn't have those types of judgment because the, God isn't a human being, an anthropomorphic being. God is a divine energy and intelligence in my experience. And therefore the, the projection that we have of this person just doesn't hold true for me. Okay. You wanna delay your, the delay your life? I mean, you wanna throw away the rest of the 40 seconds? Oh, no, I got 40 seconds? Yeah, 30 seconds. Can I speak to another question? There no, well, well, finish, finish on that, that point. We can get the next, the other question later. But. Okay. So once again, the, the point being, as a former atheist who rejected God in its totality, it wasn't until I decided to do my own research to understand the different books of the Bible, the different books of the Torah and all of that to come to my own understanding. And someone mentioned liberation. Well, for me, my connection to God is my liberation. That's where I get my liberation from. Okay. We have first question, Diallo, and then who, who's next with the uh, clarifying question? Ms. Arthur, okay, Ms. Martin, and okay, Diallo, go first. First of all, there's a lot of individual definitions operating here, and I find it next to impossible to communicate, discourse, debate, or even reach a true agreement when people are operating off of individualized uh, definitions. Um, so at the very least, if you have an individualized definition of God, I would ask that you give a comprehensive or complete definition of how you define God. And I would like to ask Michael, um, you stated that people project characteristics on God, and then you proceeded to project several characteristics on God and, and, and to define God's characteristics. How are your conclusions about what God is and what God doesn't do any different than the Christians or the peoples who project on gods and have a projection that you, re uh, um, that you re uh, reject? Well, again, the question was, does God like? Who does God like? And so my, ex my explanation was, God doesn't like any individual separately because God isn't a person who's choosing to like or not like a group. So I define God in my explanation as the grand overall design, which for me is from a scientific perspective. So I'm not projecting anything on God from a human perspective. My, again, I mentioned at the very beginning, these are my beliefs. This is how I see God, and that's how I define God. Okay. So if you got another one, Diallo, we can come back to you and go to- I, I just wanna, I just want, because I don't feel like my question was answered. Okay. 
I asked him to distinguish why his projections or his definitions are any more or less valid than a person that who believe that God is an omnipresent, omnipotent, omnibeneficent male character in the sky, the Christian manifestation, the Muslim manifestation, the Hindu manifestation. How do you distinguish your quote unquote scientific God or have any more evidence for your God than anyone else who has the same perception or projection of what God is or the very existence of God? Well, once again, this is my projection, my interpretation of God. That's how I see it. I'm not saying anyone else has to see it that way. I'm saying my interpretation, how I see God. That's it. Okay. All right, Ms. Martin. Who's next? First of all, thank you for Michael for your um, response to this question. Why does God like and who does God like and who is he or she and punishing and why? My question to you is wh what transpired for you to move from atheists to the ideology that you hold now? After divorce, bankruptcy, and foreclosure, I concluded that God did not exist. As a result of going to therapy and dealing with some my own emotional, psychological issues, I started to do my own emotional healing. And through that process of uncovering the trauma, I decided that, you know, there's got to be more to life than just my brain and my intellect. So I decided to research religions. So I started going to different places. I went to Buddhist temples and I went to Muslim mosques and I just talked to people, asked them what they believed and why they believed it. And so through a three and a half year journey of my own, I came to an understanding that works for me. And that is, once again, that there is this divine energy and intelligence that created this universe that I have access to. And when I access that intelligence, that energy, I can accomplish anything I set my mind to. I got a question close to Diallo's question. So quite often um, when I dabbled in studying the Bible, I've come to uh, acknowledge that majority of Christians do not use the Bible as the final word of the, the final authority, right? So it's kind of like the Bible says use it as the final authority, but majority of them don't use it as the final authority. They kind of just like everywhere. So with that said, and everybody having this idea of, of God, what is your final authority? Can you articulate that? And how does that affect um, either uh, participating in American capitalism being dominated or oppressed or whatever? Like, how, how does that affect socially with everybody else? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, for, for me, again, I think there's, I think there's a distinction between being a Christian and Christianity. For me, Christianity is the process through which we become Christ-like. So Jesus came to give us the, to be the roadmap to lead us to our own divinity. That part of us that is divine, which I call Christ, is not, you know, see people say Jesus Christ as if Christ is his last name. I believe Jesus was the personality through which God demonstrated the Christ. The Christ is alive in every human being. Jesus came to teach us how to access that Christ. Now, when I access that Christ within me, then once again, I have access to be, to do, to have anything I set my mind to. Therefore, Jesus said, these things and even greater things you shall do also. Because what he was saying is we had access to his Father. The Father, the Christ within me, is what I tap into. Any other? And, it, and, it ter and it ter in terms of social, whatever you were saying, I don't look outside of myself for liberation. I look within to find my liberation. That is the source of my true power. So things outside of me have very little bearing on what I can and cannot do. Okay. Well, that just ignited one more question. So I, I think, again, that sounds very similar to certain Christians, like, for instance, my pie in the sky, like, you can dominate me here, 
but I'm going to be there in heaven. So there's nothing you can really do to affect me. How does that, how does that, how does that, um, what does that mean to you in terms of like, and maybe you agree with capitalism, I'm not sure. But let's say, for instance, you, there's this economic violence against you, psychological violence against you, and it's affecting you because you, the way you eat and what you eat and where you work, how do you separate yourself from that? Is it a form of escapism or what, like, explain that a little bit. No, once again, if I access this energy, this intelligence that I'm talking about, okay, now, as an entrepreneur, I obviously believe in capitalism. I believe in creation. As a human being, I can create anything my heart desires. So I've created companies. I have a publishing company. I have a, a program for kids. So I create these things as a result of my connection to that which is something greater than myself. Because that which is something greater than myself is literally, literally expressing itself through me as me through the things that I create. Okay. All right. So... Appreciate you, Miss um, Martin, Michael, and Asafo so far. We're going to, are y'all answering two separate questions? Okay, all right, so we'll we go to one of y'all, whoever's first. I'll go first. All right, so I am answering question 16, which is, has there ever been any limita uh, imitation of the white church or white culture by the black church? And I believe that there has been, um, I believe that basically most of, of, I believe all of really what you see is, is just a, uh, an imitation. And I don't really think that black people as a whole, we know why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so I've, I've been in non-denominational churches, AME Zion churches, um, Baptist and Methodist. <laughs> and my father used to be a pastor. So I've, I've seen a, a and, it, and it's very interesting that even though you have all of these different takes on, and I guess this kind of goes into another one, but you have all of these different takes on religion for Christianity, all of these different faces and rules of it, but really all of these rules are just basically coming from the Catholic church. And as I can't remember her name, the lady who went first, um, Arthreda, how she had mentioned earlier that the Catholic Church, it was basically, it was built over the dungeons. It was, it was not a good thing. They actually were not pushing the word of liberation or spirituality. They were pushing control. And so I feel like right now, what we have is a mass ball of control that the Black population is, is underneath right now. Um, like Lent, for example. Lent has no, no bearings in the Bible, and yet... The Methodist Church loves to do that, which is it's it's a, a it's a pagan ritual, but we embrace it because the Catholics tell us to. We don't ask questions, and I think that's really the detriment of our people is that we stopped asking questions. And I know one of the videos even mentioned that that's one of the biggest problems with our people today is that we take everything at face value. And I think it's because of the fact that you know, um, back in Africa when they were trying to take over. And, and, and oppress the black people there, they thumped them with the Bible. When they brought people over here or found people over here, they thumped them with the Bible. They had their slaves and they told them, you know, you can only read these chapters. And so if you think about it, the slaves, they were only given certain parts of the Bible. And from that, they, they memorized it. And I feel like those are the, there's certain scriptures that are always talked about um, in the churches and they don't really branch out from that. And so I think there's a limited, um, knowledge of even the entire Bible in itself. And so I think that um, overall, we, we have to look at ourselves as a people and say, hey, if they're teaching this, does it really serve us? They're not teaching the Bible. They have the Ten Commandments. The first, you know, thou shall not kill is a commandment, yet we have military and they say it's okay. But because they say it's okay to kill, they get us thinking that it's okay to kill. And, and even with meat, eating that. So it, it's all murder. And I feel like it's a pawn and it's a trick to make us think that we cannot. You're right. There you go. To finish that thought, I think that it's, um, it's all basically a, a trap to try to make us be condemning ourselves to continually sin. And if we continually sin, then we can no longer um, reach spirituality. Uh, first, 
clarifying question. Ms. Martin, Asafa, was that a hand up? All right, go ahead, Ms. Martin, first. Marcel? Yes, ma'am. Well, Laura. 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 <laughs> okay, Laura. How do you define sin? Um, I define sin as not reaching your mark and not reaching your full potential. Going against yourself. If we're going through the Greek definitions, which is also my definition now. I, may I ask a, a follow up with that? Yes. So, so uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, you believe that the Christian faith, the, the, the way Europeans have taught us to practice Christianity, I like to word it that way, has interfered with generations upon generations of Black people with their inability to fulfill their purpose in life because of the way they have been taught Christianity or the practice of Christianity. Am I hearing you correctly? Absolutely. I, I, I definitely agree that um, because of the way that we were taught to worship, we, we take away any chance of us realizing that like Michael said, that we have God within us. They make us think that we had to go through a person in order to find Christ. They made us think that we had to um, go through Jesus in order to get Christ. And, but you can't even get to Jesus without going through your priest. So I feel like they just took the word priest out and made it the pastor. When at the end of the day, the, our bodies are the temple of God. So you can't, there's nothing stopping us from getting there, but that's not what we're taught. Anybody else with a clarifying question? Um, okay. I have one. So if um, if you, I mean, obviously you say that there's pretty much every aspect of church is probably regurgitated of um, mimicking white church. Yep. So is there a way that you think black churches should navigate or experience religion or Christianity? Yes, I think that, um, I think black people need to take a little bit more ownership of Christ in themselves. I think that um, how religion is taught today that we kind of have a scapegoat called Jesus where we can sin and do whatever we want and then just say, I'm sorry, and then think that everything is gonna be okay. Um, I think that is kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, the, the European teaching that because they could kill the, and they thought they were doing it for righteous causes. They were told, hey, if you kill these people, God will love you. You will go to heaven. So they teach that to us in the same way. It's, it's changed over the years, but it's the same message of don't take responsibility for what you're doing. You don't have to be a good person. All you have to do is say you love Jesus and you'll go to heaven. I think that the black people um, and everybody honestly needs to examine themselves and say, hey, am I operating out of love first? Um, am I trying to dominate other people? Like they had commandments, but even I think that the commandments in a sense were still warped as ways to control people. At the end of the day, they, in, in one of the scriptures, they're like, above all else, love. You have to love each other and love yourself. And showing you can't love yourself if you're not willing to look at yourself and examine your heart and say, hey, is there something that I'm doing that's blocking me? We all have to go inside and, and look at our demons and do that internal work. And sometimes it takes a tragedy in our life. And like, like even I, I, I can very much relate with Michael, what he said earlier, because I, I feel like it, all of us, it takes a devastating event in our lives for us to get mad enough at God to say, you know what, why did you let this happen? And the moment that we realize that, you know what, it's not God's job to make life comfortable for us. It's our job to be, to grow enough to handle what's going along and to be able to transmute what's going along and not, and to re respond and not to react. So then we can create. Okay. Any other clarifying questions? Ivy? You got two minutes, 30 seconds. Um, so I heard you say that uh, 
uh, so people are taking the Bible and they're kind of twisting it and there's commandments uh, that we're supposed to live uh, within. So how do you bridge the gap between that and like acts in the Bible that were um, ordained <laughs> by uh, either prophets or God himself for things such as uh, uh, taking land from individuals, going to war with individuals, and even the killings of different individuals. Okay, so I am going to probably sound a little off the wall with this, but I actually believe that there are multiple gods of the Bible. The Bible that we see today is been, has been pieced together um, from different stories throughout history. And I feel like there is the one source, the wholeness that created all and everything, the universe, everything that exists, the breath that has no gender. Um, but I also believe that there are deities that can also create because creation wants to be able to experience. And the only way to experience is to pinch yourself off and to be able to have different experiences. And what do we, what do we all want to do? We all want to create. So I think that there was something that did possibly create part of the world in a sense. And it was a different God because they were sacrificing to something. So um, I do believe that there are spiritual forces um, and they do have some power. And I feel like there was a force that liked sacrifices and whatnot. And then the time shifted and something else was in charge and then it was no longer acceptable. So do I subscribe to sacrificing things? No, because we're not in those times anymore. Okay. All right. So thank you, sis. We are going to Marcel, I think it was Diallo, then Jimmy, then Ivan, and then whoever else. Yes, so which sir. One, which one are you going to get, bro? All right, I'm going to do number seven. African Americans are the most religious group in the United States. What are they getting in return? And I'm going to say absolutely nothing, um, except for getting led to the slaughter. Uh, I worked in a church for <coughs> seven years, six years, as an audio engineer. And um, I was very privy to a lot of the, the, the inner workings of the church. And like Laura said, they, especially the Methodist church, they only teach from certain books at certain times. They, there, there are certain chapters that you would never, ever actually hear in 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 the church you know and so i feel like this makes our people comfortable with just um going along to get along uh doing the rituals and 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 then being able to walk out the door on sunday and do whatever they want in the world you know what i'm saying so um i feel like the some of the pastors are manipulating our people into further bondage by telling us to put our power in a magical white man or even a magical black man, um, speaking of presidents and whatnot, and uh, or 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 voting in particular. Uh, so yeah, I, I believe that uh, our our people being religious is a problem. Um, one of the hugest problems for me was Ash Wednesday, where they x out. <laughs> your pineal gland and there's no there's no basis for that anywhere that i could find besides the catholic church telling us to do it so i'm i'm concerned that that all these things that we are doing is not actually getting us closer to spirituality instead we're just religious you got a minute and 10 you done i'm done all right thank you. clarifying question first clarifying qu question all right. Uh, okay, Micah, then I'll go after her. Go ahead. Um, it's not really a question, but just to bounce off of that. Um, put it, put, you have to put it in you, the question form, though. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, do you feel like a lot of Black people are under the guise that religion is good for us simply because there's, you know, those select few that, have, that are religious and have to achieve success? I think so. I think that people will, will, they want to model success. So if someone is saying that 
this was my the catalyst to my success it's natural for someone to say hey let me try that maybe i can produce similar results i don't know i can't remember if there was another part of your question there uh, that's good all right i got one who else got one um so are you going to tell me that nat turner denmark vc uh marcus garvey all those people is not a benefit of religion for us, given that we are in this space now and they kind of like use that to get us to the space right now? Um, I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say no because all Marcus Garvey and you're talking about with him wanting to go back to Africa and all that stuff, right? <coughs> um, we, it goes back to us, living here and i guess kind of the uh, one of the things i've been fighting with and the question that went to michael is yes we have this spiritual plane but we also live here so we kind of have to deal with the issues that we are dealing with here and marcus garvey he really there was nothing that really addressed it didn't really address anything if, if you know what i'm saying it just made people feel better okay oh, Beretta. okay sorry i'll go off mute though Question. Yes, ma'am. Do, do you define religion and spirituality the same? No, I do not. Um, I believe I believe that religion is an adherence to a strict form of code and conduct that may not have any basis in morality, um, mostly probably based on man's law. Uh, for example, paying 10% of your taxes, that sounds, I mean, 10% of your tithes, that sounds like a tax to me. So I'm not sure um, if that's something that is really something that's beneficial for us. Was there, there's another party question. Oh, okay, yeah, so spirituality. To the spirituality part. Okay, yeah, so spirituality is more being in tune with your, with your internal self, like, um, once you are able to combat so many of the lies in your own head that you've told yourself, that other people have told you, that religion has told you, you kind of be, you kind of gain a more a sense of discernment to different types of let's call them. You you can feel the energies and the truths in different types of statements and different types of scenarios. So I feel like being spiritual is just being tapped in to that that energy, like all of the animals are spiritual. The birds are spiritual they are, because they are connected to that one source that animates everything, all of us. All right, any other clarifying questions? Okay, Ivan, go ahead, we got 340. Um, so you kind of spoke on um, you, uh, feeling that religion uh, was just a way for, to basically, a strict set of codes for people to follow. Do you feel like um, black people's religion is a branch of them attempting to gain white acceptance with certain practices like uh, always dressing to the nines on Sundays, um, had the way you had to act even going or being around the church um, and, and the way that kids are treated and how they got to be is also uh, all uh, kind of geared towards appearance, do you think that that's an arm of Blacks trying to gain acceptance as well as them being strict Christians? Do you think that's a, that was an arm of Blacks trying to gain acceptance from whites? I believe that, yes, it was an arm of Blacks trying to gain acceptance from whites, but I also think that there was a, another element of whites forcing that upon us to place us into a box. And all of that kind of came from slavery they 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 justified a lot of slavery with certain pat with certain scriptures. They would only allow the slaves to read certain scriptures. So a lot of things that we do aren't don't they don't have a basis in the book. A lot of the people don't do what's in the book at all. You know, so I think that if we take I want to make sure I say this in a discreet way. I, okay, 
I think that I think that the Bible is very valid, and that we if we can remove the anger and all of the hatred that we have for white people um, away from the text and be able to see it for what it is, we can see that it's just a guide for us to live in, in our highest form. Any other clarifying questions? Um, you know what, just because we got a minute, could you speak about, um, you said the guy that for us to live in our highest form, could you speak about the, it being canonized by a guy who was in control and then what we're getting of it is, is it different? So if it's being canonized by somebody else who's probably trying to practice hegemony, how can you still say it's something for our highest self? Because there are other books that are out there that are not in the Bible that point to the validity of a lot of these things. Okay. All right, no more clarifying questions. We'll go to Diallo. And then we're going to Jimmy. I don't know who else next, but um, so for people just coming in, everybody's picking their one question. They've got three, up to three minutes to answer. After they answer, we got up to seven minutes to ask some clarifying questions. Um, and so we just have, after Jimmy and Ivan, we have Brian left, Micah, Chris, and then the 803, I don't know who that is. I don't know if that's you, Brian. I don't know if you got two. Okay. All right, so go ahead, Gabby. My question was uh, number eight. Um, why do you think there are so many denominations? Mm -hmm. How does that affect black churches and the black community? Um, the reason that there are so many uh, religious de denomination, uh, more than uh, 30,000 recorded within Christianity alone, and is if you get into Christian cults and other sects like Mormonism, it's bifurcating and, 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 and reproducing or Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, they've been pretty good at keeping their uh, you know their their cultists under lock and key but they are an offshoot of another christian cult so the reason why is because um and i think that evidence has been manifested here in this discussion because god is not real because god is a figment of human imagination and a delusion anything we say about god all of the, the sudden becomes god's characteristics so i wanted to find god as a man in the clouds or some type of magical force within me or outside of me that automatically becomes valid because there is no way to research to validate or invalidate or test it the very concept of god and the spirit is beyond time beyond space and beyond matter so it is unreal god is literally even as the bible defines it in other religious texts unreal um I say that, and the same goes for spirituality. I call spirituality religion for lazy people because as the brother Marcel pointed out, you, you, can, uh, you don't have to adhere to dogmas and strict rituals. You can make up your own rituals. You can be like Erica Badu and wear crystals and burn incense and say this is a spiritual practice and there's no way to test it. There's no way to validate, invalidate it, no way to reciprocate it. So that is the reason why we have so many denominations because everyone can make up their own stuff because religion is literally make-believe and we attribute make-believe to children but there are whole systems and behaviors and we expend resources on adult make-believe but because we're adults and we have authority we can make believe and literally make people believe utter delusional things uh, and as far as how does that affect the black community, it creates disruption, uh, it creates disunity, it has led to the emergence of countless cults, and it has caused many functional black organizations, political black organizations, to descend into culthood. Because whenever someone that is charismatic and assertive enough within a black community, they can branch off and create their own using their force of will, and there is no way to test or, or to invalidate or validate those claims. So that's why I assert 
that anything black people do must be number one, secular. You can have your individual de definitions and beliefs, but you cannot impose those on collective. Anything you bring to the collective has to be grounded in something that is researchable, material, testable, and that can be validated or invalidated. Did I get in under? I can't even hear you. You're on mute. 12 seconds, eight seconds, five seconds. Okay, so that's the effect. It, cre it creates disunity and cultism. And okay. all of our organizations should be strictly secular that dealing with our liberation. No room for spirituality or religious delusions. Okay. All right, who's first with the clarifying questions? We got- um, Y'all got time to waste. I want we all. Marcel. <laughs> yeah, we got time today. No. We got Marcel, Ms. Martin, and who else? I ain't see anybody else. All right, go ahead. All right, Diallo, I actually agree with a lot that you had um, said, especially with about us being children. We never grew up. Um, we got bigger, but we never grew up, especially mentally. But um, my question for you is that, yeah, I see that you put a material five cents frame on, on everything that you were presenting. Is there no space for experiential knowledge um, sometimes I can't tell you, but once you experience it, you know. Uh, knowledge and experience are also material. You have a central nervous system. You have a cerebral cortex. Your intellect, your personality, your mentality, your self-awareness is physical. It's biological. It can be, it fits, it fits within. So there is room for your experience, your interpretation, your critique, even your conclusions are all biological, they have time, they have space, and they are composed of matter. So that doesn't exclude what we sometimes call immaterial things like our personality, our thoughts, what we incorrectly call our spirit or our soul. There are physical realities that that is based on. So I don't exclude it, I just take it out of the realm of make-believe and put it into the realm of reality. That's all you have to do with that. Because when you take the real concrete reality of the human psyche and remove it from concrete reality and put it into the mystical realm of make-believe, it turns people into puppets. It makes them easy manipulable. As um, I can't remember his name. Uh, Voltaire said, if you can get people to believe, believe absurdities, you can get them to commit atrocities. But a person who's Men mentality, their mind, their beliefs, their understanding, their experience are grounded in reality. They tend to be critical. They tend to be thinking. They tend to be willing to reject authority when authority cannot validate itself. There, that's why, without exception, every authoritarian oppressor has tried to impose some delusional thinking, whether they say believe in Christ or even say it like the Egyptian elite said, oh, the Pharaoh is God, man. Every single oppressive system, even Stalin, who was an atheist, created a cult of Stalinism because you have to get people into this delusional space to move them, to subvert their critical thinking. You still you muted, Larry. Martin, Ms. Martin. Okay, um, thank you very much. I too do not, I do, I agree with the majority of your, what you said. I'd like to flip the question um, in response to what you said. Every society, putting aside black people, every society on the face of this earth, almost from the beginning of documented mankind has created some form of being entity Not. as a godlike figure that's some type of entity that's not true okay well then i have a two point two part question for you mm -hmm. name for me societies that have not created any kind of spiritual godlike figure first part of the question Second part of the question, the majority have. So why do you believe the majority have and the one that you, or the ones that you can identify haven't and how they manifested and grew? Okay, to answer your question, the thing that you're calling some supernatural force, every single culture, when humans finally evolved far enough to begin to create cultures, Every single culture created myths, they created folklore, and they created 
explanations for phenomenon around them that they didn't understand. Some of those cultures created rituals around them. Other cultures did not. If you recall, when the Europeans came to Africa, one of the things they always accused us of is being godless. That's one of the main accusations. Oh, these godless savages, these godless heathens, Native American, Asian, and European cultures, the earliest known cultures, the Twa people of the, um, if you read Pygmy Catabal. Yeah, go ahead. DNA, mitochondria DNA leads to the, to the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. Those people didn't have a deity. They didn't have a God. And then there were the animist religions who people said that, the, that, that we worship the trees. We worship the mighty river. We worship the sun. And the sun, you can worship the sun. The sun is real. It's verifiable. It has mass. It has takes up space. And it, it, it exists within real time. And people would worship the sun. So you don't need something that's mystical, untouchable, unseeable, unknowable, that works in mis mystical ways to form. There have been cultures that have formed religions. I mean, people in the... In, in, in the uh, in, in Native America worshiped the jaguar because the jaguar had certain qualities that they wanted to embody of resilience, of strength, of cunning. And they literally would worship a jaguar. So you could say accurately, humans have a tendency to lean towards veneration and worship, but we don't have a universal tendency to lean towards um, a God. And, and God started to emerge and formalize religion started to emerge with the emergence of kings, monarchs, and, 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 and hierarchical systems. Prior to these kings, monarchs, and hierarchical systems, you and, 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 and these uh, nomadic people, we only recognized, or the Europeans only recognized the people who had something that the white man could latch on to. Like if you notice, white folks love Egypt because there are a lot of qualities in Egypt that relate back to them. They've ignored and erased these atheistic, godless cultures. But they called us godless for years, and we took offense to that, and we wanted to prove to the white man that we had gods. And that was a horrible mistake to try to validate ourselves to white people because some of the earliest put-downs they put on Africans and Native peoples around the world, indigenous peoples, uh, those are our godless people. And we were, and I'm proud that we were godless, and I hope that we can reach the state of godlessness because that's the only path to liberation. Can I, can I follow up? Quick follow up. Yeah, yeah go ahead. You actually answered the question. You took the word that I said and only answered it as it related to God, but you answered my question because my question said entity, anything. It is human nature to create something to worship. No, we didn't create the jaguar. We didn't create the sun. We didn't create well, mountains. We rivers, identified we it. We did not create those things. So you said create, like God was created. The Bible, I mean, just go Google Bible copyright. The Bible is, Bible is a copywritten document. Okay, so, you're missing. I don't so, want to take up too much time. I don't want you to. Well, I'm telling you that someone people, else, but you're, you're, um, you're taking the word instead of what it is my question is, but you're actually answering it. I did the answer, your question. answer to the question. The answer to the question is yes, human beings must worship. That's Some, not, that's not what, my answer. Don't put words in my so, mouth. So, I'm, what, what, I'm what, asking what, what, the human question. Human I'm asking do the not question. have to worship. I said that human beings have a tendency to find things to venerate. Some cultures had the big man culture. There is a book called God, Pigs, and Witches that talk about human belief systems and human rituals. And there were some cultures, uh, uh, some of the, the uh, Arawaks, Kalanagos, the Eastern Islanders, where there was a big man in the culture. And the big man was the man that held the wisdom and he was worshiped. He was venerated. So yes, we do have a tendency to venerate to, to well, then you've answered that, my question. But that is not worshiping, and that is not something we create. You falsely stated that we create things to worship. Now, your God was is a delusion that we created to worship, but there are material, real things. Right now, I could go out and get a, a, a statue and, and worship it. I didn't create the statue. So uh, I think so, you're conflating two separate things here. So let's let's put a pin there, and we can pick that up um, at, the, at the later half. Um, I think we were at Jimmy. Thank you. 
Jimmy, then what was okay. it? Jimmy and Ivan. There, there go brother Heber. Okay, we'll go. Jimmy, Ivan, and then whoever okay. else, and then brother Heber as well. All right, I don't have my external mic, so I'm trying to use this on on uh, computer mic. Okay, it's good. All right, so number three, um, people are doing God's work when they blank. All right, I'm ready for the, for the darts and the arrows. Um, because this particular statement um, obviously is subjective. Um, so it just depends on what type of angle that you're looking at. So for me, um, people are doing God's work when, and I just have three things. We could actually name uh, 12 or, or 30. So um, if I don't choose the one that you were thinking of, we can add it into this discussion. Uh, the first three things, um, people are doing God's work when they uh, are committed, when they are active, and when they are teachable. Now, I say that because notice this statement is not dealing with now your belief system. This is dealing with how your belief system behaves, okay? This is dealing with what does what you behave look like? How does it manifest itself? Um, instead of doctrine, this is dealing with duty. So regardless if you Hebrew Israelite, if you white man's Christianity, if you are, you know, whatever it is that you're talking about, your belief system, uh, how does it behave? So I believe that when God is, is working, um, and I believe he's using everybody uh, in some sort of way, I believe those three things are, are going to be evident. Number one, commitment. And when I say commitment, this is dealing more so with the perseverance. Um, I have some notes, meaning uh, when they, yeah, the commitment to your belief system. And I love the passion that a lot of people have on here. Um, you're willing to be committed to your belief system, regardless uh, if it's popular. Uh, you're also not fair weather. Some people are committed, but as soon as times get hard or they're tested, then their commitment goes out. So they don't really have the perseverance behind what they believe. Um, the second thing is uh, being teachable. Um, I believe that we don't know it all. And I'm on here tonight for the first time demonstrating that because I'm teachable. I love the testimony that uh, Michael was talking about. Michael would have never gotten where he is had he just arrived at atheist and just said, okay, I'm done. Nobody can't tell me anything no more. You know, I see people have that type of attitude with that belief system, but he remained teachable. Um, and so it, it, you continue to look at your belief system as a journey that you never arrived. You're continuing to learn um, by being teachable. And this is nothing new. And in, in some of our workforces, they have what is called continuing education, professional development, you can be a doctor and still be going back to take continuing ed. So the last thing is, my time is up, uh, active. You have to be active. Yes, 15 seconds. Meaning um, this is not for church. This is not you, uh, for religion. Active means you are actually, um, uh, you are actually, think about fraternities. They look for you to be an active member, not just something on paper but rather active. So those are the three things. My time is up. I'll go ahead and add some more whenever I get the, uh, the clarifying questions. All right. <clears throat> Who's first with the clarifying question? Laura. Laura, then so Diallo. I went, I went so, all right. Laura Diallo. And Ms. Martin, did you do something just now? All right, Laura Diallo. Go. Okay. Um, just to clarify, <laughs> I guess it's helping you out a little bit. When you say um, number three, active um and, and i know you said you don't want to just be a uh, in the church on paper but um what what do you suggest that we can do in today's society actively r right now to, to better ourselves with in in regards to yeah, our situation everything. okay go ahead keep asking like keep going to what, what with, the, with the church um, what, what can we actively do with the church to benefit right now? Well, I mentioned, um, I mentioned the church as if that's where some people are. I have one here on my notes, uh, religion. 
Some people don't do the church thing. Like me, I don't, the church thing, um, the church being the people, it's not a building. I never have put God in a box of a actual building where he's restricted, where I have to go into and do church on Sunday. In fact, I just spoke on a lesson two weeks ago called um, Asymptomatic Religion. And it rubbed people the wrong way a lot because it was against traditionalism. But I took the COVID-19 language about asymptomatic you know, where, and I was saying how people can walk around being infected with, a, with religion and don't even know it. Um, and so I was just throwing out church, I was throwing out religion, but I was saying whatever your belief system is, because I'm trying to focus on what Larry has us speaking on, you're doing God's work when you remain active. Look at this forum tonight. Larry, whatever his belief system is, what he's doing right now is a demonstration of being active it does no good to have a belief system that's not that's not affecting anybody else by it i mean if you believe that that's right man you should be passionate and trying to help some people man i learned stuff from larry just dealing with veganism and 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 posing questions about vegetarian stuff i never even thought of i never thought about that but if i was closed-minded and traditional and and not teachable then I would have never gotten the information that he's got me. So I'm being enlightened as I go. And I, but it's only because of people that are active. But go ahead, Diallo. Can't hear you. Sorry. Um, where and how did you, uh, where and how did God communicate his will to you? Where? I'm trying to put, see how that pertains to, People are doing God's work when they are committed, they're teachable, and they're active. If I say to you, I have a job for you, there's something I want you to do, and then I disappear, and you never ever see or hear from me again, how would you know that you're doing what I want you to do? How did you determine, uh, how did God communicate to you what his or her or its will was? Great, your question just uh, proved my point uh, about the seed, commitment. There's no commitment there. So you're helping me out, actually, because I'm still sticking with just the actual question. People are doing God's work when they blank. And the, and the one that I put on there is commitment. You have, you're not demonstrating commitment if I hire you or actually do work and you disappear. But how do you know that? Let, let's say I said it's God's will that we masturbate daily. How is my assertion of what God's will is any more valid of yours? I That's mean... That's the, that's the first thing that came to mind as an example. Um, then I would want, I would, I would question, I would have other alternative questions for you um, based but on I that. For, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, it seems like what you're calling God's will is your projection as the brother, uh, he's gone. But the brother said, started off by saying, we project onto God. God is nothing but various manifestations of people's desires, beliefs, hopes, fears, superstitions, and things of like that. I haven't seen any evidence that God's will is anything more than a man or a woman's conclusion about what they believe they want it to be. What you don't realize, brother, you, you're doing everything that I'm actually talking about right now. See, you're trying to draw me into doctrine, and this story is actually dealing with duty. Uh, not this story, this question is dealing with duty. It's dealing with not belief. You keep trying to drag me into the rabbit hole of belief, and I'm not going down there with you. I'm sticking with behavior. Everybody on here deal, it has a different set of beliefs, and I respect that. But you cannot have, to me, you cannot have a certain belief, and you're actually, everything about you tonight is doing exactly what I'm saying. Man, you are, you are a great brother. You're very insightful. You are teachable. You are active. <laughs> you're committed to what you believe. So, I mean, this is not a debate. This particular question has nothing to do with challenging my belief system. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna let you do that. Any other, I got a clarifying question. Any other clarifying, Ms. Martin? You're on mute, by the way. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for Jimmy for answering the question. Mm -hmm. um, and my question to you, just to clarify, mm -hmm. is the, the question does not define God 
but it does ask you from your perspective people are doing god's work however you may define god or his works when they and then you proceeded to explain the actions they are taking am i correct yes based on their belief system of god right thank you mm -hmm. that was your question oh okay any other clarifying questions um i almost forgot mine oh so okay so um in terms of, of doing doing god's work right um how could you tell if God's work that you're doing is feeding into a people, even your people being dominated? Like when, when do you like, what's the gauge there? Like when, when do you like, oh, um, the Bible might say this or pastor might say this, but that God's work is actually dominating a group or dominating people. Are you asking me just in general as a separate question, or are you trying? Are you asking yeah, like, like a, a clarifying question? Like, for instance, somebody's doing God's work, right? Okay. And if what they're doing is God's work and is dominating people, would you still say, "Oh, yeah, that's God's work"? And it's dominating them. Yeah, like let's say, for instance, there's a um, a, a, a person has a, a um, trafficking sex trafficking ring for kids. And they like God wants me to manage and mentor these kids. Like, my question is, if you say that's when people are doing God's work when they have these things, like, at what point do you be like, that's not like that's not God's work, or you, you're saying if someone is Ill, is is running a sex trafficking ring or anything? That was an example. Yeah, it's it, it, God's work. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if somebody I, says I, that, I, if somebody I, says I, that I, for you what what stops this um your belief that that's god's work does that make sense Again, this is not about this is not about belief again that's why i said you all to change don't change the question to see i understand where diallo was was going at but and that's where you're kind of trying to go right now everything about diallo was dealing with the belief system and that's a separate discussion outside of that question that question and especially i guess it could fault the person whoever wrote it and worded it that way. But that, that particular question, people are doing God's work. It's dangerous. And that's where Diallo was, 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 was going at. Um, it's dangerous because what it does, it presupposes that God is this way. It presupposes that the people are all think there's a lot of generalizations and it kind of corners you into speaking for all people and defining everybody's definition of God. But I went on ahead and rolled with it because I recognize that regardless of how it's worded, it's still dealing with the work of how, meaning how it looks, how it behaves, what does it, uh, what's the duty, not the doctrine. Now, yes, separately, oh, we can go rounds all night about the doctrine and the belief system of that work. But that's not what the question is, Larry. The question is centered around the work. People are doing God's work when they blank. And all it did was just open it up. And all of you all right now can, can read that same question and come up with seven different ones I didn't even put on there. So that, 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 the way that it's worded is not dealing with the, uh, my personal belief system or, uh, or the actual um, you know, doctrine of it. But I definitely received you know, the, the, the vein that you and both the was going. Okay. All right. Who, uh, who is next? So we have Ivan. Brother Brown and Chris Cato and Brian. Uh, Brian. So who's next? All right, go ahead, Ivan. Ivan, then Mr. White, and then does does uh Jimmy still have question time for questions? No, nah, he he uh oh, okay. he, uh, his time went up. He actually went over his time went up, but we can uh, we can you can save it for the latter part. Go ahead, Ivan. Uh, so what has been Americans' political agenda uh, with religion as it pertains to Black folks? So um, looking at this question, I kind of sort of follow the, um, well, I, I want to start at a certain period because there's different agendas. So you got, you know, you have slavery. That was a certain agenda. So I want to start 
after African Americans were freed from slavery uh, and look at what happened after the Civil Rights Movement. So um, when an entity or something that we have starts to gain power, it starts to attract attention from individuals who need, like see purpose in using those things. These days uh, with the with churches, and it's not like, it's not even, because blacks obviously have a, um, overwhelming support for Democrats, but even now it's spread beyond that where you have churches that support uh, both political parties and there's political agendas. You've got people, uh, pastors campaigning for uh, individuals uh, in leadership, no matter what their beliefs are, no matter um, what it is, they can get uh, uh, some form of a black church to stand behind them. Um, so, and it, I, I even think about the um, church that I attend and looking at the pastor's uh, biography. It looks like a politician's biography. It doesn't look like the pastor of a church. What's our list? All his accomplishments, everything he's done, all the movements he's been a part of, X, Y, and Z, but it doesn't read like a spiritual leader of a church or like welcoming. It, it more so looks like if he wanted to run for office, he could use this bio uh, right here. So I feel that um, that people understand that religion is a, a very strong angle for African Americans. And if you wanna get something done, you can come to those leaders. And if you offer them some type of, uh, some type of political standing, some type of influence in whatever societies they're in, some type of, uh, uh, of socio uh, political standing in a city, for example, like the pastor of my church is a, a very prominent figure in the city of Wilmington, Delaware. Um, if you can offer them that, then the church becomes very political at that point because uh, to, in order to get those things, you have like they're not going to allow you to be in certain circles unless you're providing some type of utility or some type of service or something that they need from you. They're not just gonna be there like, this pastor's a really nice guy. And even if you look at uh, entities like um, the Vatican, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm almost done wrapping up. The Vatican has made major political decisions. The popes have made major political decisions. One of the worst decisions for African-Americans was when the Pope uh, split the uh, uh, new Americas between Portugal and Spain for slavery. So, um, that was it. Um, any, any clarifying questions for Brother Ivan? Um, I'll ask one. So would you say that the only use for the church, well, I wanna say that. Would you say that the black church has to be politically conscious and have the um, political protection over the black community? Is that is that their like one of their main goals? Would you say that? I would say that it started that way. I feel like their intentions were genuine and pure, but when they saw the power that the black, like the civil rights movement put the shining spotlight on what the black church means to the black community. After that, things became very political. Like people don't feel the same way about Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton that they felt about Martin Luther King, but these figures came from that same movement. After that, things got so diluted with agendas and everybody having their certain agenda using different people, almost it looks like as pawns. So um, with that, you lose interest of now you're not looking at what is the focus of my people. You're looking at what is it that I need to provide for the people that I'm now being influenced by outside of the church. Um, so that agenda always generally use, usually works against African Americans. So um, I feel these leaders should have been taking their pointers solely from their parishioners and and the people that they're leading uh because that that's 
it's a, a what do you call that when you have two uh, influences that that um, that it's a like when a lawyer is representing two different people and and there there's a conflict of interest. That's what it's called. So there's a conflict of interest there. You got influences outside the church with those people may not may or may not be members they may or may not be for the black uh, community and then you've got uh, your parishioners who actually need things and depend on you for spiritual guidance okay any other clarifying questions for the brother we go to the next one okay laura um ivan so how would you suggest um what would you suggest we could do to check the power of these pastors? Or do you, would you say that it's more of the boards that need to be policed? How, I don't want to even use that word policed, but um, you're right. How would you say we can stop these churches from using their powers to basically position people as pawns in a sense? How, I think how that we had to get back to the board on on church leadership and understanding like so the separation of church and state like that's a, a thing in in america where it's actually doctrine uh and it's in uh u.s doctrine that the church and the state should be separate but then we have churches that are campaigning for it. so it's not separate the, literally the church and the state work hand in hand and uh, America is openly Christian. Like they have no problem forcing Christian agendas down your throat at any turn, whenever they want to. So there's, there's actually is no separation of church and state. But what we need to do in in different churches is get back to the drawing board on what leadership should look like, and get away from like ch churches have been very rooted in tradition. But most of these traditions aren't that old. They're relatively new traditions that we adhere to. Like they came from uh, uh, like, like ages ago, like something that's been passed down through the centuries. So it's, it's a little weird to me, but um, I feel like churches, if you're gonna use that entity and that, that structure and that force that churches were at one period in time, then you need to revisit the ideals and concepts from when they were at their strongest because they're not there no anymore and you, if you start to look and address what happened what shifted and why people don't believe uh in the strength of that leadership anymore then then we need to go back and see okay what went wrong thank you okay. any other clarifying questions all right cool thank you brother Ivan. We'll go to Brian, and then we'll finish up with Brother Brown. Brian, go ahead and tell us the question you answer. Read it, and then when you start, I'll start. So it says mute. Your phone says mute, and then your face doesn't say mute. Who is it? I can unmute him. Who is it? Brian, Brian White, I think it's his 803 number two. Hello, everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, peace, peace, peace. So I chose to answer question number 11. Um, number 11? Yeah, so number 11 was, can you be a Christian and be about and or working towards liberation of African people? Um, I do believe you can. Um, I base this off of one scripture that I learned early as a child was Isaiah 117. It said, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's case, cause. Um, I firmly believe that regardless of what your belief system is, there are core values and, and moral principles that can be taken out of anything and used in your present situation. Um, as far as Christianity, being a Christian and being for the liberation of your people, I use the actual story of Jesus. What a lot of people don't pay attention to when they're reading that, he was there specifically for his people. That's what he was there to say. That's how the story plays out. He was there for his people. Everything he did was for his people. 
He healed his people. He sacrificed his life for his people. He taught his people how to exist without him after he was gone. Um, so I feel like in that aspect, even if you don't believe there are things you can learn from that and apply to that. As it applies to history, history has shown us that people have done just that. Harriet Tubman, who didn't believe in the New Testament, but believed in the freedom of the Old Testament. We call her Black Moses. We call her that for a reason. I see you, Diallo. You good. We're going to talk. <laughs> you got now, one minute and 30 seconds. Go ahead. Now, you have, you have Nat Turner, who did what he did because of God. Being from South Carolina, Larry, you know about Denmark. We don't have to go there with that. We already know. He created Mother Emanuel. A lot of people don't know that. If we want to fast forward into the 60s and 70s, you have Leon Sullivan who created the 1036 plan. That was for the benefit of us economically to get us to do things that we weren't doing back then. So history has given us examples of how we can, how you can be for your people and have your belief system. Now, do I have to impose that belief system on anybody? No. But those principles are there. Like you may not believe in God, but you believe in the same thing. You believe in seeking justice. You believe in oppression. You believe in bringing justice. You believe in the equality and the freedom of us. So if we believe in those core principles, we can meet somewhere in the middle and get that for all of us. Because the reality of it is, we're not all going to agree on everything. But we all agree that we need the house. Point blank. All right. You got 30 seconds. You good? Yeah, that's straight, folks. All right. So first clarifying question, you see Diallo, anybody else got clarifying question? Uh, Ivan, so Diallo, Ivan, go. You said me? Yeah, did you raise your hand? Yeah. Yeah, you then Ivan. Um, I hear a lot of people make fallacious claims that people like Nat Turner and Harriet Tubman were inspired by the Bible. But if the Bible is true, Harriet Tubman and Nat Turner would be burning in hell. Not only does the Bible validate slavery and admonish slaves to be submissive to their master, it gives specific details on how to treat slaves, how to beat slaves, and even how to charge slaves. Whereas it dictated that a female slave is worth half of what a woman is and what you can and can't do with your slave. So the Bible is a pro-slavery document. So if you really believe the Bible and you are are a Christian and you how can you I'm sorry how can you believe two things how can you believe the Bible and 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 claim that people who went against the fundamental doctrine and will of God are acting in the will of God that seems like a contradiction to me and also you said that you don't impose the Bible it is also a cornerstone of doctrine to spread the gospel to evangelize and to walk among the people and spread the word of God. So you just said that you don't have to impose your beliefs, but the beliefs that you hold mandate that you do it. So how do you reconcile that as well? So if I'm spreading, how is that imposing? If you don't want to hear it, I'm not going to tell it to you, point blank. And spreading doesn't always include talking or speaking. It's my action. I heard a song once say, my life's the only Christ some will ever see. My life, my life could be me spreading. I don't have to necessarily speak to you and be like, hey, you need to believe in Jesus. You're going to hell if you don't. I don't do that. I really don't do that. But what you're going to see is my action. And you're going to wonder, okay, what is it about you? And then I'll tell you what it is about me. Whether you believe it's that, that's on you. Okay. Now, as far as the, the issue of slavery, so let's not act like it wasn't a historical book, first of all. Like, not history, history, but it happened in a specific part of time. That, just, just let me talk. Just let me talk. You ask the question, I'm going to answer it. It took place in a specific time. Okay? Now, I find it funny that all of... One thing I find funny, first and foremost, is that for all of the... the let me see if I can read this right. For all of the ways you despise religion, you practice the same zealous behavior religion teaches us. That's one. That's one. Second, everybody always focuses on Ephesians 5. I can't remember if it was Deuteronomy or Leviticus, but there's a verse in the Old Testament that talks about what is to be done to a person who is caught with another person against their will. So if we're going to talk about that part, let's talk about that part. Let's not pick and choose what, what we're going to discuss. Now, but uh, what was the rest of your question? I think I, I, I'm, I'm sorry.
No, I think he was asking about the um, the uh, the liberation leaders who who were Christians went against mm -hmm. what the Christian book said, and how do you reconcile it? Okay, so everybody here has heard the slave masters Bible, but do we know the history of it? Like, have we researched it to understand why it came to be? So after the Haitian Revolution, they needed a way to come up with to subdue us and get us to act right, so to speak. That's where the slave master came, Bible came in. So it was only like 14 of the 66 books. And those 14 books didn't even have complete verses in all of them. What they left out was the story of Joseph. Listen, man, everybody gave you your space. Like, that's real disrespectful. I'm just trying to talk to you right now, bro. Like, you don't have to agree with it, but you don't have to, like, all that ain't necessary. But anyway, the Slave Master's Bible was purposely created and manipulated to get us to act right, so to speak. So if the Bible is what you say it is, why didn't they give it to us as is? What was in there that they didn't want us to know? Any other clarifying questions? Ivan got one. And Laura, you got one too? All right, Ivan, go. <clears throat> so you kind of touched on the historical context. So is, so is it your belief that as times changed and you obviously were in the contemporary, that the practices in the Bible, certain practices like slavery are outdated? Like, um, and, and they no longer have a place in society because uh, I understand like the the scriptures that you brought up and and for the context that of the period the time period that was actually considered progressive so I understand that um, so do you feel like even that if obviously if that point was considered evolution but now we look back on it and it's like we demonize it X Y and Z is do you feel like we there's periods where there's no longer usefulness for certain portions and it's outdated. Absolutely. Absolutely. To, to, to touch on one of the videos that uh, James Cone was speaking on, he said it's supposed to be the infallible word of God, maybe, but because it was written by man, is it, in, it is indeed infallible. So my approach to it is with everything else, with anything that anybody says or presents, take out of it what I need and use it as it is needed. Go ahead, Diallo. I got one after you. I asked this question, but anybody who believes that there's a God or supernatural forces, spirits, or, or uh, uh, conscious energy, whatever you define it as, what would the world look like, Brian, if God was nothing more than a figment of man's imagination? That's a difficult question to ask because that's like a, ugh. there's no way to really answer that because I could say an answer and then you could turn around and say it would be just like it is right now because you don't believe in God. So how can you really answer that question? Okay. Um, question. So, so obviously, you know, when we think about our people in this country and you know if the stats are right majority of us are uh the most we're, we're the most religious right and then if we have this idea of uh, liberation i know you touched on it about like yo we can get past something if it's not if my behavior is not causing you to stumble how do you suggest that to opposing believers people who don't even believe there's a god people who believe that god both of them are of african descent and need to be liberated how do you suggest that they get past that and, and focus on liberation? That really depends on the person. Because at the end of the day, I had to, I used to say this like a couple of years ago when I first started on my little journey and I was learning things. Everybody want to be right. Nobody want to be righteous. So the first thing that needs to be done, I feel like both sides, both sides need to understand it's not about what I feel, it's not about what I feel, what you feel is what we need. So that's what we need to focus on. We can hash out everything else later because the reality of it is whether there was a religion or there wasn't religion, we're going to believe different things. 
but we're all going through the same thing and we all want the same thing. So that's what we need to focus on. All right. 9 seconds expire and then we'll go into brother brown. All right, so we'll finish up with this one and then the last part, you know, obviously with with the respects to everybody time we can have more dialogue about certain points, certain things that people say in a respectful manner. Obviously this is a one of those conversations. Um so brother brown, thank you and you'll go. T read the question and then answer it. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be a part of the dialogue tonight. Apologies for being late, and uh, because it's my children's bedtime, I got to tuck them in not too long after this, But uh, so forgive me for, for dipping out. Um, but the question I want to uh, address is number nine, should the black churches be involved in the politics, economics, and social aspect of the black community? My short answer is yes, I believe that black churches should be involved in the economics, uh, in the politics, economics, and social aspect of the black community. A part of what informs my response there is um, that um, I reject the notion that, um, I reject the, the, the illusion of this secular sacred division, uh, that I believe that a Western interpretation of spirituality and religion in general kind of bifurcates our existence in such a way that we, you know, your your mind is over here, your heart is over here, you know, but in terms of what I understand to be a more dominant aspect of an African spirituality is an embrace of the whole. And uh, and so for me to say that black, black churches should not be involved in the politics, economics, and uh, social aspect of the lives of the members of the church is a gross disservice to what it means to be actually be in service to the people your relationship with at a church. I also draw examples from, and Brother Brian listed off so many of the names that uh, in terms of people uh, in history who have shown models and shown examples of how that can work out, not perfect models, but, um, but certainly models to be, to, to be gleaned from. I don't only really would add one more to that list, uh, Brother Brian, and there's so many more we could add, but I just want to add one in the person of Reverend Albert Clegg from the Shrine of the Black Madonna, who, who wrote the book, Black Christian Nationalism, New Directions for the Black Church. Uh, and in this book, he lays out a program uh, similar in spirit to what Amos Wilson does in Blueprint for Black Power, where he talks about how churches should be spaces uh, essentially, and this is my language here, essentially be maroon spaces for uh, uh, African people so that even in the context of this country, there's some space where Black people can organize, uh, build, mobilize, and our history attests to that in so many respects. So many HBCUs would not exist had it not been for uh, the Black church. So many um, programs, uh, so many facets and features of society at large. It was organized Black people, uh, organized resources that help either provide wind uh, or infrastructure to at least the mobilization of some of that. And so uh, that's my position there. All right, in this 15 seconds, we have, who all we have, uh, I see Diallo, anybody else with a clarifying question? All right, go Diallo. Uh, my first question is, what is African spirituality? And my second question is, uh, name another institution or presence that a white people have allowed to come to power and be sustained other than the black church. And why is that? Um, I understand African spirituality, my understandings of African spirituality are informed by people like Marimba Ani, uh, who writes in her book, uh, Let the Circle Be Unbroken, uh, where she writes about this communal uh, sense of belonging where um, everything that we experience is sacred and that we understand ourselves as part of, of a whole that is dynamic that is a continuum that is changing. 
Um, I also have been blessed to do a little bit of study on um, what's called African traditional religions, which also shapes my understanding of what, it, what African spirituality is. And so not necessarily talking about Christianity in this space uh, exclusively, but um, what, Africa, what Africa descended people tend, what patterns emerge when African descended people lean into uh, um, an ethic and a morality and an understanding that shows up in communal form. And in terms of what other uh, institution white people have allowed, I think, uh, I think that's, I'm, I'm, I'm getting fuzzy on the question. But um, I can I can clarify it if you need me to. Yeah, that's the yeah second the second question. Well, the late Dick Gregory said that the churches were not just churches. And you also said, you know, people went there for refuge, people went there to get their light bills paid, they went there for sanctuary, they went there for education. The church has been everything, the center of our communities. So people are so fond of talking about the importance of the black church. But there are no other industries, even though black people have made, there were black, uh, uh, if you read, um, Dr. Clark's history, everything from black automobile manufacturing, black movie studios, even black munitions manufacturing. There were other black institutions and industries that provide for, and you even said our universities had to come out of the church. So why is everything centered around the church for African people in this nation where you look at any other ethnic group or race from Native American, Irish, Polish, Jews, the synagogue, you'll never find a Jew say, well, the synagogue is the center of everything. You know, they have very diverse infrastructure, very diverse okay. economic, but okay, I got, I got, the, I got it center and grows out of the church. I got it. I got it. First, I would disagree with you uh, in terms of Jewish people. Uh, uh, here in Baltimore, there's an Orthodox Jewish community where it's very clear that the synagogue does, and to the degree that this Orthodox community in Upper Park Heights here in Baltimore has their own uh, basically city council, they have their own banks, they have their own credit unions, they have their own ambulance and police, police, and nobody in that orthodox community would say the synagogue does not have a role in that. It becomes that space where those resources are organized, where there's a clarity with respect to uh, a, a, a view of the world, and I think in similar fashion, uh, the black church has. I'm not, I'm not placing the black church necessarily so as, as something um, so special that's beyond every other black institution that you listed the name. I'm not saying that. What I am saying though is uh, history would argue you down uh, and with respect to the, the brick and mortar uh, institutions and programs, I don't have to make that argument. History does that the black church has played a role. The role, no, a role, yes. And I think that, um, I think that, that can be a source of inspiration uh, for those who are seeking to organize today, should it be the lane for everybody? Absolutely not. Uh, but at the same time, should it be a lane that we should throw away? No. And I think that Amos Wilson devoting chapters to the black church in his book, it should be something to say that he, along with Carter G. Woodson and so many others, and these would not be deacon and Sunday morning preachers, but these were, if these are people that we lift up, celebrate, and honor, and they are saying there's something to be gleaned from the black church experience. I'm not willing to cast that to, uh, to the side. I'm willing to do that study and keep open mind there. All right, I got a um, question. So we, we know people go into systems, people who are African-centered, they go into systems, rather school systems, government, whatever, with the hopes to use in whatever they learn to build their people. Can you speak to a little bit the church's ability to do things like I know you're working on working on um, supporting people who come back to the city to work and better the city. Can you speak to those churches that are more African centered, sovereign, and then the people who are probably just talking or have conscience or whatever? Like, does that make sense? You said speak to it. Yes, yeah, speak to it. Like, as in, like. You know, people say like in terms of liberation theology or having a, a, a practice that actually is helping your people opposed to just kind of like arguing points, right? You know, it's one thing to say, oh, this church is this, this, but oh, sure. if you have like receipts, can you sure. kind of speak to that? Sure, sure, yeah. I, I think, you know, 
you'll not you'll not have me stand up and say every black church or every black preacher you find is going to be some somebody worthwhile of respect or somebody with uh, following. But I would say that uh, the charlatans amongst the clergy class get far more attention from those outside of the church than those who are committed and working every day for the liberation of black people and moving resources in tangible ways. I wish more people knew about my brother, Pastor Earl Fisher in Memphis, Tennessee of the Abyssinian Missionary Baptist Church and the revolutionary work he's doing in Memphis. I wish more attention and time was given uh, to my brother, Pastor Reggie Williams in University Park, Illinois for the, the wonderful work that he's doing. I wish more people knew about the Valerie Richmond. So I would just say like the long list of black preachers who are really doing this work every single day, there's a reason why, um, I believe there may be some reasons as to why those names aren't known, but I will say in terms of brick, in, in terms of concrete things, I'll say very quickly, you know, I'm blessed at, at Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in Baltimore. We've given birth to the Black Church Food Security Network, where we are working with churches across the nation to grow food on their land and then moving trucks back and forth from the north to the south and the west. We're so grateful. We just got the Church of God in Christ came on board with 8 million of their members to move food. Now, that's a fundamental need of Black people. So whatever your, whatever your spiritual religious belief is, we need to eat. And in the middle of a COVID situation, in the middle of a time when we are facing uh, uh, police oppression and brutality, the continuation of it, we need to be looking at ways that we can do for ourselves. And I only say that in this one small example, the Black Church Food Security Network patterned in learning from the Nation of Islam, uh, gleaning from the Mormons who have their own food system, that the church, rep this, ex this example is one in which a pastor and a church is working to meet the needs of black people, no matter what their religious or spiritual uh, positions might be. And we need food. So that was, that was his time, but we are in the second half of it. And I know people got to fall off. So as you fall off, that's, that's cool. Um, and everybody's satisfied with the answers and I appreciate everybody. This is the time for re rebuttal. Respect, respect for rebuttal as long as people have time and then we can kind of dialogue around that. My brother Diallo is itching. He looks like I feel, I feel like you're coming coming for me, so I'm gonna hold on for a little minute if I go tuck my baby's head. All right, go ahead, Diallo. Um, I get this a lot when, when I talk about things like reparations or the importance of the church. Black people love to reference Jews. I just pulled up the demographics where you mentioned the Orthodox Jews who only make up 10% of total Judaism. And of that 10% they make up within that 10%, only 62% actually are part of the formal Orthodox that you're because I lived in New York for over a decade and I lived one block outside of Crown Heights with the, the Yaakov uh, Hasidic Jews but over 30% of Jews are non-religious and another 30% of Jews are reform Jews, which would classify as secular type Jews. They are not operating out of the synagogue. The nation of Israel, the power center of Judaism was founded by Theodore Herzl, an atheist. And not once in Israel's entire history have they had an orthodox rabbi or strongly religious leader or, or governor from going back to, to now the corrupt Yitzhak Rabin all the way back to Golda Meir and all their leaders have been fully secular or in a religious. So the fact is it is a myth that the Jews have used their religion or used their synagogues or their religious center as a power source. That is an absolute myth. I just had to dispel that. Um, above all because we also talk about reparations in Jews but and I don't know why we always fall back to them as a model for us but I don't think that they're an example for us but the examples we attempt to use especially related to the power that religion can play in a community Jews became empowered when they started following secular agendas and secular leadership not their religious leaders starting right. from Theodore Herzl who was an and the founder of Zionism all right bro Yes, uh, I'm glad it's being recorded because I think the recording will show, Brother Diallo, you brought up the Jewish community, not me. Uh, and so that, that's one point. You, you brought up the synagogues first. And two, I'll say this. I spoke about a specific community here in Baltimore at Upper Park Heights. I was not talking about the entire Jewish community around the world. I was very specific in what I said. And if you want to come to Baltimore, we can take a ride. And to that community. We now, have I, I don't know about the New York community. 
let me, let me finish. I don't know about the New York community that you're referencing, and I won't pretend to know. But at the same time, I'm talking about my hometown. I'm talking about down the street from my house. And so I just want to just, just land that there for clarity's sake. I question, question, I question, I question I other ethnic groups. I, I listed, but you, you're the one that locked on to Jews. I listed Jews as one of many, but you, you made Jews because if you had made the Polish people and you said if the Polish or Eastern Orthodox was the source, then we could have went with that. So yes, I did list the Jews amongst many and I'm glad it's recorded as all, but you latched on to use Jews as an example, not me. Tell me this, Diallo, is, is, there, is there one uh, well, obviously, he knows that there is one Jewish church that's centered there, economics, political, whatever yeah, around the church. The Orthodox, they're a cult. There's so, okay. so many documents and documentaries. It's like comparing the entire black community to the nation of Islam or the Nuwabians. Let me finish. So, if you use the language or unorthodox or orthodox, and you, you answer the question about denominations, you know that there's different practices of Christianity, just like there's different practices of in Judaism, right? Right. So what I'm saying is, if there are a remnant or a um, um, whatever you call it, a minority of Jews who actually use that as a center base in their practicing, is it possible that the church could do that too? As long as the church is not harming no, it's not Jews. possible. Absolutely not. And here's why. If you look at the many exposés, there's one article from the Village Voice called How the Rabbi Got AIDS. If you look at, on the surface, yo, these people look organized. They have their own police force. There's a Netflix documentary on people who have escaped the Hasidic community. It's a parasitic cult. The Hasidim is a parasitic cult. They don't give their members autonomy. They don't allow their uh, members to seek education, marriage, or any type of lifestyle outside of the group. And when people try to break loose of that strict top-down cult control, they do everything they can to subvert and kill, up until kidnapping children away from their mothers, from uh, not allowing people to see their families. So I have a saying that cults don't cultivate. It's very easy to get control of a cult and make a cult like the nation of islam is a cult they say everybody dress away speak away and behave away and it looks wonderful on the surface because we love to see coordination organization right here in chicago we got the hebrew israelites all dressed in purple marching down the street uh, uh chanting the same slogan and that unity and display of power but 100 percent of the time we, I mean, even the Jonestown cult, which was predominantly black, and the Branch Davidian cult, they have farmland. We, get, we, we can't do beyond the surface because uh, what gets you there, what, what you use to get you there will follow you there. So if you use cultish, irrational, delusional ideologies to get you there, whether it's Elijah Muhammad's nonsense or uh, Orthodox Jewish delusions and nonsense, what will get you there will follow you there. We cannot take shortcuts to liberation and unity. It has to be secular, it has to be rational. So uh, no, there's nothing there for us in, in the church or in the synagogue. All right, let's stick a pin right there. We're gonna come back. Anybody else has something they wanna chime in on? Cause I have another follow up. Go ahead, sis. Um, I wanted to chime in just that. It seems that we're looking at the the church at in what it is right now as all it can be and that i i think that might be the disservice we all understand that there is a huge problem with how the church is ran right now we we understand that there are cultish qualities of it because they don't want people to think for themselves however we we ha we cannot ignore the fact that hub was because people didn't have community centers. Churches were basically community centers. It, it, they were resource centers. They were places where people could go and get resources and get help and get sanctuary and plan and be safe. So if we can get back to that point, maybe we just don't need to call it the church. That's just kind of what it, it what, what, it, the, the church is just a building. If we get out of the, the religious side of that, and just get, you know, look at it as what it is, which is a resource center. I mean, honestly, I think they just call it a church for the tax write-offs at this point. So, so I love that. Let me, let me, uh, let me, okay, yeah, go, go. Cause I want to ask a question that bounce off of that. Go ahead. Ms. I, I, I want to respond to um, Her Heber Brown. Is yes. that how you pronounce your name? Um, I first of all, thank you very much. I had to bounce into a meeting just to show my face, and then I'm bouncing back. The Zoom thing is a beautiful thing. 
um, I many years ago, after I took my trip to Africa, I read a book which I really re recommend for everyone on African spirituality. And it is called Of Water and the Spirit by Maladoma Somme. He wrote other books, um, that's only one, about African spirituality. He is um, someone who doesn't necessarily put all his eggs, or he does not put his eggs in the Christian basket for a lot of reasons, which I'm not going to get into. But what he does do is give a insight into the, um, I'm going to say the word dichotomy, but it's actually a conflict between Africans attempting to practice Christianity. And he speaks a little bit on Islam too, because we've taken on the, the religions of the oppressor, of the controller, and the need, and he also spends a tremendous amount of time talking about the nature of African people. And we have to understand that by nature, putting aside the various thousands of religions we practice, we are a communal people and the religion is a manifestation of our need to be communal. Um, to the point where everything we do from cooking to grooming to clothing, our in, in innate nature is to be together. And that leads us to this conversation about church and the, I think you had 17 or 18 questions about the black church and why things are birthed out of the black church and why the, the um, Europeans indoctrinated us with their way of thinking around the church, which really for us was just a way to escape from a spiritual perspective. Um, he does a fantastic job, not the only person I've read, but of all of the books that I've read on African spirituality and how Africans can be equipped to do the work they need to do to heal their communities. It's one of the better books that I've read. Um, the second book that I read, which I implemented myself is Rituals. Now, my brother, Diallo will say that it's paganism and whatever, whatever you want to call it. I just know where it worked. <laughs> it worked for me. And I did not, didn't, I didn't come with a preconceived idea. As a matter of fact, a lot of that stuff I used to think was demonic and all that other stuff. Till I began to learn more about who we are. Um, Larry, I don't know how much time Larry spent in Charleston growing up, but if ever there's a place where they actually practice African spirituality and mix that thing up like a gumbo in Christianity, Larry going like this. Yeah, is New Orleans and it's Charleston and it is still practiced because it is powerful. And you, it's, it's over and above our understanding. Um, so that is the one thing I wanted to say and agree with you that some of those brothers and sisters that you're mentioning, the fact that they are able to do what they're doing is because somehow they have tapped into it, even if consciously they, have, they don't realize that they have. And I've met people, I've seen people, I'm now I'm talking about Africans, because it's different with Europeans. I cannot speak to how they work together. But as people of African descent, we have to acknowledge the uniqueness of our being and the necessity of our communality for us to be strengthened and healed as a people. Now, you can call it whatever you want. First of all, I do not like the English language. I do not like it because it is a duplicit language. It's intentional that they beat our language out of us, but we stuck with it. But it does not always express what it is we're trying to say. It does not always define what it is we're trying to say. So that's why sometimes things have to be communicated in spirit. That's why, like, I'm looking at all of y'all right now, and I know where, just about where everybody else is. Not so much because of what y'all are saying, but because what your body is doing. And that is part of being an African. I've been to that continent like 10 times, different parts of the continent, even in the Caribbean. And I can tell, 
and they can tell. And we, as a people, need to push aside a lot of the European ways. We have taken on the persona of so many of their ways that we have a very difficult time reaching that special place that who we are. So I thank you, Brother Brown. I thank you for explaining how people are moving beyond and they are accomplishing and they're feeding the community, notwithstanding the conditions that we find ourselves in. And that's what I just wanted to say to you. I caught your whole presentation. I had to go in and out, but um, I want to thank you for that. All right, let me, let me pose this question before you go, Dr. Diallo. So you have uh, an, an indictment and a list a scorecard or whatever it's like they're not doing this they're not doing that they did this they do if that's the case would you say that if they do all those things will it be acceptable or you just wanted to throw it all out does that make sense who are you like, directing diallo diallo oh like so you say you let's say for instance you'll be like yo the church do these six things blah 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 they to do this wrong, they do this wrong. If a church do all six of those things right, will that be acceptable to you? Or you just should throw it out the way and call it something else? Like if, if you go to the Middle East and the leaders and the elites of, of, of the Arab nations found that 60 to 70 to, or even 10% to 20% of their citizens started to adhere to African uh, cosmology, African rituals, African mysticism and religions, they would declare a state of emergency. In the United States or the Western world, if, if, if white folks in mass started practicing or, or studying Vodun, started to adhere to uh, the Ifa, they would declare a state of emergency and they would totally transform every institution from academic to industrial to prevent this. African people are the only people who are willing to dwell in and compromise with alien thought systems, alien worldviews, and alien systems. So I think, number one, all alien, all belief systems, religious rituals that came to us through slavery, rape, colonization must be purged. They have never legitimized themselves or made themselves worthy. Number one. Number two, every single African belief system, every single African ritual, needs to be strictly and aggressively re-examined. And if it has found to be lacking, that should also be purged. Because we, when they got to the African continent, we had our own religions and languages and spiritualities. And there's a lot of hustlers out here telling us, if we go back to Bodun, we go back to Yemaya, uh, uh, Odulamare, uh, go back to the Ma'at, we'll be free. We, we got enslaved when we only spoke African language and only worshiped African gods. So if it, that was liberating, we would have never been enslaved. So. Black people, we need a cultural revolution, every element. And my evidence is when you look at nations that have power, and when I say liberations, I don't have these flowery things. I have concrete definitions. Freedom means all of the territory and life-sustaining resources and all of the institutions that are required for your survival, sustenance, and advancement are under your direct control. That's what freedom is. That's what it is. And the nations and the peoples who have that are secular by and large. And the nations of the people who lack that are by and large more religious, meaning that religious and mysticism and spirituality is inversely uh, proportional to people's unity, freedom, and organization and liberation. Inversely proportional. Those are two things are at odds, and history and the facts demonstrate that. And what religion has been for us is a place of escape and a place of identity because when you don't have real world material power then you can have power in the sweet by and by somebody controls every element of your life they educate your children they treat your elders when they're sick and they control it top down and they dehumanize you you get to say well i'm spiritual because they can't take that away because it only exists in your delusions and imagination so, so, so purge all alien religions and and revolutionize all african belief systems and spirituality so, so let, let's stay there. You said a cultural revolution, right? Yes. Cultural revolutions will have behaviors, right? Yes. And those behaviors should produce outcome, right? Yes. Are you saying that people who still hold on, because that, that's what the hell they need to hold on to, let them hold on to. People who hold on to those religions and practice the behaviors 
and gain the outcomes, are you still, you still need to like, you need to think like, you need to lose this word. You need to lose this ideology. If they're doing I work, a, I work with religious people. I coordinate with people from various spaces. I've gone to the church, like the brother said, I, my, my last farm, that I, I, I promote veganism and urban agriculture and food sovereignty. And my last plot of land that I was farming before I moved on to our next space was at a Jesuit uh, campus of a Jesuit uh, Christian school. So I, yeah, if somebody believes Spider-Man is gonna swing down and save them in the time of, I don't care because I, my goal is to make, so I can work with religious people. But if, but and my thing is like Malcolm X taught us, you, because people say, well, well, you don't believe in that stuff. Would you have followed Malcolm? I said, I wouldn't have worked with Malcolm while he was pushing the cult nation of Islam, but I would have worked with Malcolm on the organization of African unity because Malcolm said, this is a secular organization. So if you take out your religion while we're doing community work, then I will critique and dissect it. But if you keep it in your heart, you keep it in this clouds, ether, wherever you put your God and all that nonsense, wherever you keep it, if you don't put it out on display, then I will respect it. But once you make it, try to make it part of the material action, just like everything else. If somebody comes and say, we need guns, I'm going to evaluate that. I'm going to determine, well, armed insurgency, is it viable? Do you have any precedent for it? Do we have the resources for it? If you say we got to be nonviolent, we have to be non-reactionary, then I will study that. And if you say God is the way, then I'm going to dissect and, and tear that down too. Everything that comes that people bring for us and say it's for us and will liberate us needs to come under the most aggressive, unrelenting scrutiny and critique of anything else. Because that's the most important thing in the world to us right now. I receive that. I receive Take that. nothing at face value. I love it. I Laura, Laura uh, Brian, chime in if you need to. Laura, go ahead. All right, and, I, and I'm gonna go on that too because I, I definitely believe that um, everything needs to be questioned, everything around us, and I also believe that everything needs to be questioned because our five senses will fail us. Um, it's a fact that what we see is only a itty bitty tiny spectrum of what's out there. Our human eyes cannot perceive what is physically out there. So if our eyes cannot see it, but other things can, I know you like to be in, and this is a little bit to, to, to you, uh, uh, Dio, I'm saying, I'm messing it up. <laughs> but um, I feel that their spiritual, now re religion, because I, I like to keep religion and spirituality separate because I believe that they are two totally different, separate entities and in, in different ideologies. Um, but as far as spirituality goes, I don't see a problem with it in the sense of expansion of the mind. Um, I believe that it is a disservice to us if we only look at what is around us and try to look at everything in a, um, uh, a, a what a, like a left brain kind of way. Um, we need that creative um, space as well. And how to put this nicely. Sometimes if you're going through a huge struggle and you need to pray or believe in something to get you out of that, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. If, they're, if people believing in something gives them strength to do things that other people otherwise could not do, power to them. And there is a power there. Even if other people are not able to tap into it, that does not um, discredit the power in in believing or channeling something where wherever it's coming from if you're getting power from that then that cannot be discredited just because someone else cannot tap into it because there are certain preparations that the body has to go to it is a fact that the pineal gland has been calcified by the diets we all know about uh, veganism and cure but the black diet in general is terrible on in in a whole which kind of came because of slavery. And I think that was part of the reason that started the suppression of all of our mental faculties as black people. Um, we know that we're not operating at 100%. We know that our bodies are not doing what they could. Um, and we know we're not thinking critically. 
And because that our, our brain is a month, we, we have to exercise it. We have to grow it. And I believe that things like meditation have been shown to help strengthen your mind and strengthen your connection and, 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 and strengthen your, your intuition. So if these are, are things that can be measured, there was a, a, a science done back with the Native Americans. Um, they wanted to use the Native Americans to figure out how they were able to be such wonderful hunters. And they found that they, they said that their intuition was in their hair, their long hair. When they cut their hair, they, are, they, they're, uh, they were not able to notice people sneaking up behind them as quickly. So if they were able to do this study on multiple people and saw that there was something with their intuition that was connected to them having their full faculty, their, you know, their long hair in that sense, then there has to be something to it. It's the same thing with um, miracles, miraculous healings. I personally have a friend who had uh, stage four renal failure. His kidney was basically needed to be replaced. They said he was going to die if he didn't do anything. He said, I don't care. It's in God's hands. He believed. He sent out prayer requests. And not only was his, his kidney healed, but the doctor actually said that it was 100% healed. They did not know how it happened. They said physically there was no way that your kidney should have been able to be go from 20% working to 100% working without any kind of medical attention. Did, so, did, he, did he like change his diet or do anything? Um, he did. He, he did, but he was doing that beforehand as well. Okay. All right, question. I want uh, either Markel, Ivan, or Brian I'm 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 appreciative that the can, guy can I respond to a couple of, of, of her points. Yeah, after this, keep it. Keep it. But I wanna I wanna really uh appreciate what Diallo said about you know, we gonna do this work, but everything is gonna be, you know, picked apart to make sure it's the right thing for us. And I looked at it as like don't light up a cigarette in front of me because I don't want to smell smoke, right? If we're doing this work, I don't, I don't need you to like make a choice for me that you need to smoke a cigarette, All right? So uh, Brian, Ivan, or Markel, when you think about religion, spirituality, whatever one, I don't care which one you want to choose. I like to also add, I don't like the escapism stuff. So I don't want you to force it on me, and I don't want your ass to be escaping from our conditions here. Like if it's time for the fight, I don't want you to say Jesus is going to take care of it. I ain't fighting. Like I ain't got time for that. So. Can you speak to your feelings about like, again, working for liberation and then the escapism force? Like, are you okay with working with somebody who has a totally different belief system from you? Um, I would say that I don't have a problem uh, working with any black people as long as their views aren't counterproductive to what we're directly doing now. So that doesn't mean I can't support them, but like if we have two different agendas and it basically we're building a house and taking it apart at the same time, then I can support their vision and what they're doing and we can do something separately. But I don't have a problem working with people who have uh, completely different views than I do. Um, it just like, we need to do things that make sense. So if we had like, like uh, it's, uh, I was listening to this TED talk and they were talking, it was a marketing based TED talk uh, and they were talking about how the, uh, they failed in trying, Coke was trying to find uh, a way to reduce the calories, but keep the taste and please everybody with one, one, just one Coke. And the guy that they brought in to do it, his resolve was, you're not looking for the perfect Coke you're looking for the perfect Cokes. Like you need to make different brands uh, and different, uh, develop different brands for different people so that they fit that those people and their natural naturally what they uh, the product that they're going to naturally like so I kind of feel it's the same situation here but I don't feel like we need to make a million different uh, uh, movements or whatnot but if we could find something where it's supportive but also is very efficient in having different people work in their best capacities because like I tell people like for me, like I'm a soldier. So like, that's kind of sort of where my skills are and my talents are. Is there a role for that in, in a black revolution? Absolutely. Is it everybody's role? I don't think so. Is it, would I be best served trying to be like a, a leader sitting, planning other things other than 
how to tactically do things. Like I, I don't. I feel like it would be doable, but you'd be forcing me into a role that's not best served for me. So, uh, so that's kind of sort of where I'm at. What is like we need to encompass a lot. Like you have roles and and responsibilities for everybody, and also different. Like if there has to be a different movement, if if they have to have their own branch or whatever it is, I feel like that needs to happen. But I don't have a problem working with uh, anybody. Brian or Markel? I feel like we need to, we, it is incumbent upon us to bring all of these different um, groups in or different ideologies in, especially in the time and age that we are now because we need all hands on deck, right? And just like my brother Ivan said, everybody is, is everybody doesn't have the ability to do every certain type of thing. So I think that we are cutting ourselves off, especially if the goal here is the liberation of black people to be like, nah, well, I don't really like how you get down. We can hash that out later, right? But right now our focus is on, hey, we got a problem in the world and we need to deal with this first. And then all this other, all this other extracurricular stuff about, about it, we can handle that later. Brian, I don't know if your audio is it audio. No, it looked like his audio went out. Oh, so he's probably talking. I can't hear. I can't hear you neither, Diallo. Brian isn't muted. I just think he's not talking. Oh, it seemed like he had called in earlier. Yeah, I think Brian, he had like two different yeah, his, his call thing. He also about. looks. He looks frozen. Yeah, he does look frozen now. So I think it's unless he's meditating, <laughs> unless one of the ancestors has possessed him, he hasn't moved for a little. So I think his his speed is frozen. He's probably oh, okay. technical. Right. Well, it's uh nine forty. We can go a little bit more if y'all want. Diallo, your responses to Sister Flora. Well, I first want to give a working definition of spirituality, and whenever you meet a spiritual person that makes any spiritual claims. This definition will hold up if you're willing to be honest. Uh, as, and I got this from Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, who stated that, you know, religion is a strong emotional belief in a non existent nothing. Um, as far as spontaneous healing, I worked in diagnostics for over a decade. I worked at everything from trauma center, centers to geriatric centers. I participated in uh, epidemiological studies for everything from AIDS and H HIV to, tuberc the, to the ballooning, ballooning uh, tuberculosis um, epidemic in the Bronx in the uh, mid-90s. And the thing about that is what we don't understand is that medicine makes a lot of misdiagnoses. My son just had a, he's a skateboarder. He had a severe fracture where he shattered his knee into 15 places. And when you injure yourself or have a disease, they have three stages, the diagnosis, the prognosis, the diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis. And in each of those stages, there are many varying factors. And the doctor was correct on my son's diagnosis. He was at it, he was correct on the treatment, but he was completely wrong on the prognosis. And if I had strong emotional beliefs and non-existent nothing, I could argue that my son has miracle heal. He doesn't have a limp. He was supposed to be essentially crippled for life with a shattered kneecap or have a full knee replacement. And he walks around here not taking out the trash and doing all the other stuff, not using that miraculous knee healing to do what I told him to do. But he's fully healed because we realize that we are flawed. And because I can't explain how he was able to beat the odds or whatever, it, it, I can fall back and use it to validate my delusion because we have to look at those kind of things to validate our delusions or our beliefs, or our spirituality, or our God, because there are no concrete material things to validate it. So whenever we find something that's, that we can't, like you said, can't see or explain, we throw it in the God box. You know, but that is called formally the God of the gaps fallacy. Whenever something happens that wasn't explained or wasn't expected, it's God. Even though there's no proof that it was God. It could have been a leprechaun. It could have been, you know, uh, Houdini or, or, or Merlin. So that's called the God of the gaps fallacy. I'm not saying that we know everything, but everything we thought we knew 
that was attributed to God that later on found material evidence for, 100% of the time, we were wrong when we say God did it. From lightning and volcanoes to healing to microbes. We thought when we got sick, before we had, like you said, our eyes don't see everything, but we have tools. Everything from binoculars to see far to microscopes to see closer. Every time we thought it was evil spirits making us sick, you know, we, we get microscopes and micro and understand micros, virology, and we find out, nope, it wasn't demons or curses. So God has been disproven every time God has been tested. Spirituality has been proved, disproven every time spirituality has been tested. So this same person who had the miraculous healing, he also uh, should have ran off of a, a mountainside and his car acted as if it ran up on a ramp when there was no rail. So that, in its sense, should not physically have happened. He should have gone off the cliff. But miraculously, something, cur an invisible wall. Was that videotaped? Was that recorded? He did not fall off that cliff. Was that recorded? No, it was not recorded. In, in the scientific community, anytime you make a claim, even, uh, what's his name? Uh, Albert Einstein, with his theory of relativity whatever that is called peer review if you make a claim that cannot be verified and tested it has to be dismissed so if it was not recorded or if he didn't say hey i didn't know it was going to happen then what we have to do is put that brother in the car put monitors in the car and outside the car and have him reproduce have him reproduce that thing other than that i will dismiss it because 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 claims made without evidence can be dismissed just as easily. I'm glad. I'm glad that I'm glad that he said that because this this is one of the things that I feel like if we have more time, I feel like we should address because if you if you if you just if you don't have an emotional connection to what Diallo is saying, you can look at different people using their version of God. God told me to shoot you. God told me to do this. No, God, no. And then I saw this, and Jesus came down and spoke to me. And like it's like every there's who can like what? <laughs> like I, I I like I'm telling you this this started when I actually studied the Bible, and God is telling these people direct opposite stuff from the Bible. I was like, how in the hell? Like, and and it said it's like do not add to or take from. Like you add to. Like so it's like I feel like there should be some kind of. You know, and maybe that's the thing, like, yo, just here, don't talk about it. Here's the, here, here's, here's the thing. I think that, um, I think that Diallo, the, the, the mental aspect and the spiritual aspect are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, I think that the, the mind, everything that wasn't here before we got here is of the mind. So the mind is that powerful to create things out of thin air. It is in the mind until it becomes real. So leading with that logic, the same thing can be said with God or religion or whatever. Once it's in your mind and you have an idea of it and you can conceptualize it, you can bring it forth into this world. But your mind doesn't create things out of thin air. If I denied you oxygen, I denied you proper nutrition, your mind would cease to function. And people who are going through stages of starvation or malnutrition lose their cognitive ability. That's why the whole thing that the school lunch program found that when children didn't get a proper breakfast or a proper lunch, they couldn't learn. So it's not true that we create things out of thin air. Our minds create things using material, physical nutrients, Oxygen, particles, physical things. Our mind is a physical thing. Your mind is a manifestation of your central nervous system, your cerebral the cortex, and your mind is a product of interacting. The, the brain is, but the mind. But the mind is how your brain, like if I blow, on you, the air is invisible, but the lungs made the air. So your brain, your physical brain is physical, but the thoughts that it manifests that are not tangible are a direct product of that. And we don't need, it's miraculous. Believe you me, my mind is blown. I accept the evidence of evolution. I accept that humans are primates. We are animals. We consume, we defecate, we expire. We're born and I believe, it's a, bit of, I believe it's a bit but, of both. 
I don't need to think that there's something magical, otherworldly, or beyond the mysterious beyond in order to be impressed. I look at a butterfly ring and it blows my mind. So yeah, I don't think we need magic or, 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 or supernatural in order to appreciate the complexity, the wonder, and to value things. Ms. Martin? I, I, I want to say this, and then you know I'm, I'm going to have to call it a night, but there's some things that have happened to me in my life that are unexplainable. Now, there's a lot that Diallo says I completely agree with. Whenever folk tell me God said blah, 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 I, no. When they tell me the devil made me, no, no. That is not um, even close to how Arthreta would define any kind of supernatural energy. But I do want to say this, and I can only say this because I can measure it and I can identify it and it can be scientifically proven. When my son, I have, a, I have three children, and when my middle son um, went to visit his grandmother one year, um, I was going to work, no, I was getting ready to go to the gym, and I heard him crying, mommy, mommy, mommy. And I said, that boy ain't here, and I continued to get myself together. And then I heard him holler, mommy, to the point that I had to go in the bedroom look in his bed and say, he's not here. What is wrong with you? And I left. And I went to the gym, came back. Phone was ringing off the hook when I came back. My sister on the phone. She tells me, Arthreta, you have to come to, she, he was with his grandmother. You have to come to your mom's house right now. Um, there's been an accident. Long story short, my son cried out for me five 600 miles away. Um, he was hit by a car and had traumatic brain injury. He was put in a coma, an induced coma. The um, tube to drain the fluid off his brain um, happened when he was six years old. We could not bring him out of the coma for two days. Um, finally, and at that time, they didn't let children in the ICU, but they let his brother in the ICU to try to talk him out of the coma. His brother talked him out of the coma with transformers. Three months later, he had to learn to walk, talk, eat, etc. My son is now, he'll be 40 years old this year, in June 30th. Since that near-death experience, he has had three other near-death experiences. Just in February, he lived in Las Vegas, came here, heart failure, almost died. He has a gift. Now this, he has a gift. Some people would say, they, they can't explain it. You say, show me a picture. They actually show a picture. He can look at an animal and the animal will fall dead. He has that gift. Scare everybody. He has a power of knowing things he shouldn't know. Now, scientists right now, Johns Hopkins, et cetera, want to take apart his brain. He says they will not. He has lost his sight because of a stroke that should have went in his heart. But instead, for some reason, the blood flowed out the back of his head and his ears, which should have been a clot that went to his heart. He's now 40 years old. Now, some people would say, well, that's God and God is blessing him, et cetera, et cetera. I believe it is something far more powerful and for whatever reason, because I cannot put God in a box. That's why I don't even like the word, because I am not even going to define what that energy is. But I do know in my life, I have seen that energy manifest itself in ways that can be measured. You can take pictures of it. Sometimes I'm even taking a picture of it. But science cannot explain it. They can see it. They can see the result. Just, there is no way that a child that was thrown 40 feet, land on his head, should even live to be 40 years old. His brain was juggled in his head. Now, that, I feel, 
is a blessing from ancestors. How I know? Because as soon as I stopped trying to explain it and started to receive it and accept it, I started seeing all kinds of things manifest themselves. No, it is not to the extent that we can wipe out white supremacy. Then again, maybe it is because we just not tapped in. We don't know who we are. We don't know the level of our energy. I know that it can do this much. So at this season in my life and his life, because now since of Corona, he decided not to go back to Vegas for now. Um, He's moving back into DC, but there, the, he freaks me out. He freaks out everybody because he knows things he shouldn't know because he had three near death experiences. So there is something to this death thing. There's something to this power thing and there's something to ancestors. And the last thing I'm gonna say is the people who founded this country, the reason why this country is so powerful is they were not religious people, they were scientific people. And they learned how to tap into the meridian and the energy levels in this, on the globe. And that is where they positioned various things, both in Washington DC and in other parts of the world, because they are scientists. Where did they get that scientist, scientific information from? From us. And then they beat it out of us. My last comment, I thought hoodoo, voodoo, all that stuff was demonic, just like I was taught by the church. And then I found out that lo and behold, these people were documenting hoodoo and voodoo and encyclopedias from the enslaved. And they practice it. Yes, they do. They practice it. So there is something to it. I don't know what the something is because I don't practice it. I only know that there is power there. Some folk may call it God. Some folk may call it ancestor. Some folk can't even be proven. But when you get to this point, you say, I only know what I know. And I only see what I see. And I, in promoting the African experience, know that there is something there. And we as people of African descent will find our freedom and our salvation. Not necessarily, our body will follow once our minds and our souls are freed. I appreciate you sharing that. Anybody um, want to do some quick final words? Not too much. So we can go to bed and eat and all that other stuff. <laughs> um, we can go around and around and, and uh, close it out. Starting with Freeze Man. I'm joking. He's not there. Uh, uh, Laura. All right. I guess in, in, in closing, I'll just say that um, it's about, I, I love this because I know that at the end of the day, we all have to keep learning and there's still so much to learn. And the fact that we have been here for however long that we have, yet there are still things that we're learning about the human body. Um, I find that exciting. I find that, I feel like we, we do have this gift that we were given. It's the perfect vehicle for being on earth. It's self regenerator. Regener it can regenerate itself just as all other living things can regenerate themselves. And I also like to think that what we have right here, this is just a vessel that our consciousness is downloaded into it and that we are controlling it. But I don't feel like, um, I, don't, I don't feel like this is the end all be all. I don't feel like what we see is all that there is. There is still talk that we are in a simulation <laughs> as well. So um, that everything is frequency and vibration and um, nothing is solid. So that being said, every, even, even this conversation right here, there's no real telling. Are we actually having this conversation? Are we sleep right now when we go to sleep? Our mind does not sleep. So even though our consciousness, we, we, we think that we're, we're sleeping in our bed, we're dreaming. So since our, our minds never ever shut off completely or else we would not be breathing when we sleep, um, I think there's much to be still discussed about the mind that we don't know and that science can't even begin to touch on. Diallo? I, I, I implore, I mean, I, I, I appreciate everyone for taking time to, to, to share their positions and, and, and to hear uh, my, uh, 
point of view, I think that um, right now, uh, African people, it's bigger than racism, oppression, colonization. Right now, our oppressors are destroying the life-sustaining capacity of the planet Earth. So not only do we have, from what we had to deal with our own, the potential for our own extermination through genocide, we have to, to deal with the end of all living things in the world, from the coral reefs to the polar bears to, to the sperm whales to, to bacterial and plant life are not surviving capitalism and white domination. So, and I think I have concluded through, through much study and examination that certain fundamental things that we have to accept is we have to be grounded in reality. Amos Wilson pushed this a decade before, you know, I ever became what you could be called conscious, that we have to be grounded in reality. That must be our starting point. And anything we build or conceive from there, it has to be grounded in the material reality. Because if we are dealing with the unreal, if we're dealing with fantasy, myths, and make-believe, even if we, we succeed, we will eventually fail. So I encourage that our organization should be secular. It should be rational. It should employ everything from the scientific method to critical uh, analysis. When we, when we do conceptualize what we can do and how we can make a positive contribution to the just aspirations of African people. Love it. Ivan. Um, so this conversation was interesting. Um, so one thing that I kind of took away from it is uh, that we have to, you just have to be careful when we're dealing with our beliefs and make sure that we're not pushing things um, on other people. For example, me, myself, uh, religion to me is just me being my best self. So I know I'm a better person when I'm practicing this religion. Does that necessarily even mean I believe this religion or I'm not open to other things? It absolutely does not mean those things in any capacity. It just means that I know there's a difference between me when I'm not doing this certain thing, and there's a difference, a different Ivan when I'm doing those other things. That's not to say that something else doesn't serve that same capacity. I could start doing yoga and it, it produced the same uh, Ivan. So it's a, so for me, it's like uh, I understand everybody's point of views, but like certain people and their views on religion or anti-religion is like you don't you. Religion means something different to every single person. Like if religion is what's keeping me out of the gang or keeping me from street life or whatever uh, it may be, that's what the purpose that is serving in my life. And it means something different to every single person. So you just have to be careful with that because at the end of the day, like I said, for me, I'm open to learning about everything. I read about everything um, uh, and I, I don't close my mind to anything. And I'm also very, lo I'm pragmatic, logical. I, I believe in science. So um, just sitting back and looking at, listening to the two different sides going at it. Um, a little bit of uh, that was lost there because it's uh, like, there's it's like, you got these views that are like, <laughs> it's like being on a, a pool table. It's like my ball is like, <laughs> cannot knock all around, uh, but religion to me just means me finding practices that make me better than, than what I was and mentally uh, and, and uh, keeping me in a space that is positive. Love it. Mama author, Ida. I just want to thank you for being taking the lead role and having letting us have these types of discussions. I value everyone's opinion. And I learned a lot, which is why I was double dutying it tonight. And um, yeah, let's just keep talking and we'll get there. Absolutely. Thank you. So I don't have much to say other than y'all probably can understand why I love to sit in a room full of people that's smarter than me. Um, it's probably one of my favorite things other than reading and cooking and traveling. But I appreciate all of y'all. Um, and I don't know the next topic. But I'll know in probably a couple of days. And then if y'all want to come on those too, you're always welcome to. Y'all have a good night. Sleep well. And do not pray to white Jesus tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right. Awesome. Y'all have a good one. Bye. Bye.